Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. Good morning. I'll wait till we get everybody all set up and we can get started. All righty. Some people are just getting their audio situated, but um, today we are going to be going over emergency and critical care. Um, so any questions first that you guys wanted to go over or any, any things that you guys had? I was just going to ask a quick question um, about, I think you remember me talking about the dilutions yeah, um, and the total volume. I poked around at work a little bit yeah, um, and unfortunately they're doing it the opposite yep. than what we discussed. And I just wanted to reiterate exactly what the VTNE was going to ask for. And then I'll study, study that way accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, for dilutions, it is that it is that you have your whatever parts that you're making. So whether it's the one part, you know, of, of your drug or whatever, even if it's serum to your total parts that you're making. So if it's, mm -hmm. you know, one to 10, then you're going to do one part, you know, your drug and then nine additional parts of saline to make 10 parts. Okay. Now, I'm glad that you like verified whatever your hospital is doing so that you guys have that protocol in place because that way no one, no one is like, or you don't have multiple different ways of doing it. Um, even though it isn't like textbook form. Um, right. But that way you guys are all on the same page. So, um, but that is like a one to 10 is, a total part of 10. So okay. that way that's like and if, you're, form. if you're doing a one to three, your total volume is three. Correct. Yep. So it's one part into two to create three. Okay. Yep. yep. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the about like blood transfusions and like what's a major uh, cross yeah. match or when to do that which one is the one getting tested I feel that I, I always get those uh mixed up yeah and also about the different uh transfusion types like plasma like full blood or frozen stuff like that can we go over that yeah most definitely so cross matching and then different transfusions that we do And I'd say for VTNE, they probably aren't going to go super, super in-depth, but it is really good to know the very basics, like like Von Willebrand's disease, like what we would potentially use for those types of things. So we'll kind of go for that um, type of thing. Um, actually... I have like an old lecture, but I redid it. I was like, I just looked at my lecture, um, but I can pull up certain slides. Here it is. Okay. Um, anyone else have other things? I had a question about an app that I've been using just so like if I have any downtime, like I can just click through questions. Yeah. It's one that I saw in a group. Like I've tried um, the vet tech prep and okay. it was, it was good, but it was expensive. Yeah. Um, 
and I found this other one in a group and it's it just says VTNE test and it has like a dog and a cat and a blue square with a plus on it okay um and it kind of like works you down through like you go through the 10 domains and it like takes you in sections but I didn't know if anybody had ever really used it yeah and like because it was like only 20 bucks for a month of it yeah um so it was kind of nice there but like I've gone through like I'm almost done with the animal care and nursing section which if anybody needs large animal questions for some reason they're really large animal heavy in the middle of it yeah but like I didn't know if you had seen any of the questions or yeah like the efficacy for it yeah because that was somewhere I was just like why are you asking me this (laughs) right so again um I think that um some of them are going to be really good and some of them are um tend to be interesting just based on what how they're or who they're written by too um so uh, it tends to be that a lot of these individuals that write even things, so even vet tech prep, um, when you look at the contributors, um, the contributors are very heavy based in DVMs, which is fine to have like DVMs writing for it. Um, but um, DVMs haven't actually taken the vt before. So they're, they tend to go a little bit heavy into what they know in NAVLI, right? Um, so question based as, as that, so you may get things that may seem a little bit DVM focused, um, and not necessarily like vet tech focused. Um, so just be a little bit wary of like, is this going to be really vet tech focused, um, or vt and focused or, is this, you know, more DVM focused? Um, is it a bad thing? Like, no, like I think that any question of how it's written is kind of a good practice because you're starting to just practice yourself, but just kind of be wary of who's contributing to these questions. And then um, like, just just know that maybe if there seem like really hard questions as well, that they might not necessarily be complete VTNE questions that they seem really out there as well too. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. There was just like a couple with like the language and like what they were asking seemed like really up- outdated and like a couple of them were mm. like not, useless but useless like not in the sense of like only like one person would know it like everybody would look at this question and be like really yeah (laughs) you're asking me about this (laughs) right right yeah so you know I won't say I'll say that the VTE is semi-outdated they have somewhat recently been updating quite a few things but yeah some of the apps can be somewhat outdated um and just depending on what you're doing um like pocket prep is kind of a nice one that's not as like um expensive as vet tech prep too um if people are trying to like just be careful on cost um but yeah I try when I'm looking at things I try to look at contributors to it so that you know is it super super heavy focused on um you know dvms or do we have contributors that are at least evenly based with our credential text and our dvms because then at least we have a, a lot of different people at the table to at least write some of these questions and evaluate them together so so yeah Okay, thank you. It was just like something where I could like, the other day we had a dysphoric dog coming out of surgery and we couldn't give her Dex Dome, so we gave her a diluted Ace and I had to chill out with her in the yeah. surgery room while she zonked out because right. we couldn't move her until 
and I just sat there with a stethoscope on her and right like, through questions and it was like a game of Je- Jeopardy with the DVM and one of my other surgery texts so, yeah and that's good too because something. then if there's something that you don't know you're like well is it just me or <laughs> is it like a, yeah yeah so that's always good to do you know I'm like I don't get a lot of like sit down like the list that you just put out for like the priorities that the mm-hmm. ADMA has for the DTME helped but yeah like I don't get a lot of like sit down and really focus study so I'm like if I can click through questions I click through questions yeah you know something is better than nothing yeah no definitely um okay so let's go through transfusion stuff first um and then if you guys um think of other things then we'll kind of go through that stuff too so obviously there's more and more things that pop up so um especially with emergency and critical care because not everyone does emergency critical care so um so um this is my credentials have changed so don't worry about that yet, but um all right let me make sure i can click on these um i think i Okay. Maybe I need to. Okay, here we go. All right. So when do we transfuse, right? So do you guys ever just go based on a number? Has anyone ever done a blood transfusion? No. I've I've done a couple. Okay. So when we're transfusing, especially blood transfusions like whole blood or packed red blood cells, right? We're typically doing a PCV of some sort, correct? So do you guys go based on a number? Is there a said number? Usually we, w- we would go like below 18. I know that seems really low, but they don't really, even at 20 or 22, they seem to hesitate. Yeah. So what if you have a cat that comes in with a PCV of 14%? Does that mean that we're necessarily going to give a blood transfusion? No, you have to examine them and look at everything else systemically before you decide that. Right, because it could be a renal failure cat, right? That's just been living with a PCV of 14% and it's doing completely fine right? Other than it's renal failure. And a blood transfusion is what I say is a band-aid. Typically, it's not a cure. Um, So, you know, we'll get them through that crisis situation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that like it's going to cure this patient. It just gives them enough time for whether their bone marrow needs to make some more blood for them or in the case of a renal failure animal, why are they not actually producing red blood cells? Why is their PCV 14%? Is it because they're anemic? So yes, they're anemic, but why? Dehydration. <clears throat> so yes, but um, what? Mm-hmm. There's a hormone that is produced in the kidney that if your kidneys are failing, you can't. You're you're essentially not going to produce this hormone. Erythropoietin. Good erythropoietin, right? I love that word. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is a good star underline highlight circle, um, thing to know for the VTME, right? So we, we need to be able to have those renal failure cats produce that erythropoietin to be able to, to make their own red blood cells. So by giving them, um, a blood transfusion, is not going to cure them, right? In instead, if their kidneys aren't functioning, 
um, what it's going to do is we're giving a band-aid for that transfusion and they're going to be back to square one again in a month, right? Where their PCV is back down to 14%, right? So what do we do instead? If they can't produce a worthwhile on their own, we can give a supplement typically, right? What's that supplement? It's just like when we have a, you know, thyroid issue animals, right? It's a hormonal issue. And so we supplement them. And so if it's this animal who is lacking erythropoietin, what are we going to do? Cortisone? So not cortisone. So they're going to have a cortisone. What are they lacking? They need erythropoietin. Good. So we give them erythropoietin, right? So they'll come in and we give them an injection of erythropoietin every so often. Okay. Sometimes if their owners at home um, feel comfortable doing it too, if the, the cat gets really stressed out, then they can do that at home. But you may have heard of the shots called EPO. Um, that's erythropoietin as like brand name or whatever, or you just may call that for short, EPO. Okay, so that's erythropoietin, all right? So just know that the patient has to be clinical first because not, there's no magic number to a blood transfusion, all right? Um, because with blood transfusions, there are risks to it. So uh, sometimes we instead may give iron infusions. Um, it's not very common in veterinary medicine. Um, but if there's some blood loss, we could give iron instead, um, just to at least get them to, uh, you know, just being stable. Um, and, and then, you know, have it so that they can, make their own blood, um, uh, you know, over time. Um, and then what if we don't have their actual blood type? So this happens, this can happen every so often with cats. Then we blood type them ideally. Okay. So yeah, we'll blood type any of our animals, right? But if we say it's a, we'll go over blood types um, shortly, but say we have a rare blood type with a cat and we don't actually have that blood type in our hospital or we can't find it somewhere. Do we do like a dirty transfusion? What does that mean? Where we're kind of risking a reaction to the samples that we're infusing, but it's kind of worth the risk. So you just monitor the animal super, super, super closely. So, um, normally, no, not in a cat. Um, so if we have a cat that has like a B blood type, they actually will can have a really, really bad reaction to, um, including death by getting the wrong blood type. So it might not be worth the risk in doing that. Have any of you guys ever heard of giving dog blood to cats? Yes. yes. Okay. You, can't, you can't give cat blood to dogs, correct? I mean, you could, but it would probably just not like be worthwhile because um, we have like a universal blood donor in dogs. So it's pretty easy to find a blood donor. So but there's no universal in cats. So that's why it's kind of nice to be able to use this. So anyone know what that's called? When we give dog blood to cats. It's called a xenotransfusion. And the reason for that um, and why it works, and we'll kind of talk a little bit, is that um, there's 
alloantibodies um, and antigens, right, for cats and dogs um, that are specific to each uh, species, okay? And so because they're specific to each species, if we gave a cat blood type to a cat blood type and it didn't match, then they're going to have a reaction, okay? But because we gave dog blood to cat and they're, they're not going to have at least less reaction or if not any reaction because they actually um, don't have anything that's going to recognize anything that's a foreign invader, right? So um, that's why it kind of is nicely going to work for us, okay? So how long does blood actually last within the body if it's a good match? Let's say that. Sorry, good question. Is yeah. this something you can only do once? For what? Uh, give a dog blood to the cats. Mm, nope. You can. Nope. Oh, yeah. Cool. So how long does a good match last of blood? Guess is good. Seven two hours. One month. One month. Very good guess. So yes, yeah, between thirty to thirty-five days. Very good. Okay. Now, what if it's a really bad match, or just say bad match? About two to three days. Okay. So, say you have a transfusion reaction. All right. Um, especially especially in dogs, because you might have, you know, like the wrong, um, you know, donor or whatever. Um, it could he be hemolytic at that point. Um, though it'll lice and not be good. And, you know, that's why sometimes we'll, we'll hear people say the first one doesn't count. That's actually not true. All right. First one does count. Every single blood transfusion counts. Um, it just might mean that it will only, that blood transfusion will only last a couple days. Um, so we'll debunk that myth. All right. So um, as you guys know, blood transfusions are expensive. And so you want them to last as, as long as possible because we need the bone marrow to regenerate that blood. All right. Um, I put a nice cocker spaniel on there because as you guys know, those our cocker spaniels and any white fluffy dogs are uh, commonly known for getting wet where they need blood transfusions, right? What? It's immune mediated. So that's a little clue. IMHA. IMHA, good. Very good. So, okay. So here are some of our blood types or blood products, I should say. Um, I put oxyglobin on here, which we currently don't have in the United States, but it is available in Europe. Um, we used to have it here in the United States, but the patent ran out on it. So I'm hoping that we'll get it someday again, because it was super, super nice, especially for our cats that had um, like type B blood or AB blood. Um, and we don't always have type B blood or AB blood. Um, but anyone know what oxyglobin is? No one ever heard of it? So it is actually synthetic bovine blood. Um, and the cool part about it is that it can sit out on your shelf. Um, and, um, so it doesn't have to be refrigerated. It was really nice for general practices because even if you needed to give it to a dog in a pinch, you could too. Um, and, you know, you didn't have to have anything specific like for, you know, whole blood or packed red blood cells, but that way you could just have it available. Um, but for some reason, 
they lost the patent or whatever. So I'm hoping we get it again someday, especially with now that we we are running low on blood products all the time. So, um, but we have fresh whole blood. All right. So what we have fresh whole blood, stored whole blood, and then packed red blood cells. So what are the differences with those three? I think the packed red blood cells are filtered, right? It's almost like a better transfusion. So what what do you mean by better transfusion? Um, I don't know. It was just explained to me recently. <laughs> I, th I think it depends on what you're looking for, for whatever patient. Get the best cells, maybe, or... It's different than just a regular transfusion in that way. Okay. So if you only need red blood cells, then you would want to get a packed red blood cell transfusion because the majority of, of that transfusion is going to be um, red blood cells in that. There's going to be a little bit of plasma in there, but the majority of it is going to be packed red blood cells. That's where you get the packed red blood cells. So what happens is, is that you end up, your fresh frozen plasma is the other half of that transfusion. Um, so they spin it all down in this huge centrifuge and it it essentially separates out the, froze, the fresh frozen plasma and um, the packed red blood cells. Okay. Um, so that way, if we have patients like IMHAs, um, or sometimes even, um, you know, like acute, um, animals who just need like a raise in their PCV, like, you know, otherwise like a very, very low PCV and we just need red blood cells, right? Um, maybe acute bleeds or something we may do just a red blood cell transfusion. Um, now, so it doesn't mean necessarily that they're better, it's a better transfusion. Um, it's just a different type of transfusion, okay? Now, when we're talking about all the cells all together within the blood, so we're talking about Hey, we need to we need to have our patient get um, plasma with the albumin in it. We need um, the red blood cells, and we need platelets. Okay, what type of transfusion would we give? Cold blood. Fresh whole blood? Fresh whole blood. Very good. So keeping in mind that platelets are super, super fragile. Okay. So the first thing to die off always are your platelets. So fresh whole blood is good. Um, and I say this, once you collect it, um, it becomes stored whole blood after eight hours. All right. Now we give our transfusion over four hours, but it becomes stored whole blood after eight hours, all right? So say you collect it, you put it in the fridge and everything. After that eight hours, now it's become stored whole blood, all right? Now you can keep it as stored whole blood for 35 days because now after 35 days, um, all of the cells have died. So you'll even see in your fridge as you agitate it over time and stuff, the, the red blood cells and everything within that stored whole blood starts getting a little bit darker and stuff like that over time. So you'll see that those older uh, units are starting to look a little bit dingier and dingier over time. Um, so just kind of keep an eye on those. Um, but like I said, if we're wanting to give, you know, 
a all of the platelets on there every all the components so maybe you had an animal that came in they were a hip eye car or maybe you had an animal who was a hemo abdomen and you want to give all the components um, we would give fresh whole blood okay sometimes we have a hemo abdomen come in and we only have packed red blood cells and we may even give some um you know, you only have packed red blood cells and fresh frozen plasma. We'll give a combination of those because we don't have any fresh whole blood or stored whole blood. You can do that too. Um, but typically, if you have acute bleeds, you want to try to get whole blood, right? So um, when we go to fresh frozen plasma and frozen plasma, all right, so you'll see the difference on those. Um, fresh frozen plasma means that they have been stored for less than two years. And then a frozen plasma is that anything up to five years. All right. Um, so it just means that we have some of our proteins that are available during that fresh frozen plasma. And then some of that has been lost over time. Um, and so you can still utilize it. It's just not going to be as great um, for some of our disease processes. So um, now we also have platelet-rich plasma as well. So platelet-rich plasma, we used a quite a bit um, many years ago um, as a, a means for like ITP. And it's extremely expensive to be able to give. Like at the time, this was probably maybe 15 plus years ago. And at the time, just for the unit alone was maybe like $900. So maybe nowadays that would be way more, you know, like well over a thousand. And that's just the unit. So that's not even hospitalization and all of that stuff. And it only increased the platelet count by up to 10,000 um, 10, platelets. And we're talking like animals whose platelets were close to zero, right? And so our normal platelet count is between 200 and 500,000, right? So they would have to get several units of platelet-rich plasma. So it's not the most ideal um, thing to give. But if that's the last ditch effort to get them platelets, it's available. So what we do again is that we have that fresh whole blood and we are separating out all of those platelets um, as well. Okay. Now cryocipitate. Anyone ever use cryocipitate? Or where have you used it? Anyone know what um, Dobermans get quite frequently? Or are prone to getting? Von Willebrand. Good, Von Willebrand's disease. So again, this is a highlight circle. No, right? So not to say that this is something that we um, we can treat in the moment, but this is also a way to preventively treat too. Um, so if you already know that this patient has um, von Willebrand's disease and say that you are going to be doing surgery on this patient, okay? So von Willebrand's disease is interesting because it doesn't mean that because we're doing this neuter today, that they're going to bleed out. It means that they can bleed out at any time that they feel or they, that they go through some sort of stress or whatever. And so kind of preventively treating them is helpful. So um, many times we would give um, cryocipitate to these patients um, prior to a procedure, right? So the cool part is, is that we now have um, cryocipitate available to us that comes as a, I don't know if anyone has had that in their practice, but it, it comes in a jar that you're able to um, mix um, with 
like saline solution and then give it to them um, over a couple hours. Um, we talked about oxyglobin. Um, we have human albumin and then canine albumin, okay? So one thing that people have done is try to increase albumin through giving fresh frozen plasma because our um, plasma has uh, plasma proteins in it. However, giving plasma, um, you'd have to give a lot of units of plasma in order to increase albumin levels um, that are really, really low. So by giving canine albumin, um, it actually helps significantly um, faster for our patients. Now, sometimes we wait till the very, very end um, to actually give canine albumin. Um, and it, then we say, well, they didn't make it. And it was like, well, we kind of waited too long. So, um, you know, if their albumin gets really, really low, it might be something to at least look into trying to do. Okay. Before we had canine albumin, um, we, all we had available to us was human albumin, but the problem with human albumin again, is that it doesn't match up. Like it's like trying to fit a puzzle piece in that doesn't quite fit perfectly. Right. So they can have some reactions to it um, because it's not quite a perfect fit. So canon albumin is nicer because it's a perfect fit for it. All right. Um, and then immunoglobulins. Um, so this is really nice, too, because when we have patients who their, um, you know, immune system is really down low. So if we have parvo patients, if we have um patients who obviously have immune mediated issues. Um, we've had patients who had had retinal detachment where if you give them immunoglobulins, they might actually get their retinas to reattach if you catch it quick enough. Um, so this is actually kind of a cool little treatment to do. Also for parvo patients, you can give um, canine albumin as well, and it can be really helpful. We've also done fresh frozen plasma for them too, um, and that's been really helpful too, especially if you have patients who previously were um, survivors of parvo um, and they have some antibodies against parvo from recovering, they're able to pass that along to um, those, those parvo patients. So it's kind of fun. Questions on those? All right, now, bigger thing. How, out of these, how, um, what needs a filter? Everything. Everything, right? When you're in doubt, put a filter on it, right? So very good. Okay, so what products do we use? So um, I really enjoy just kind of this breakdown. Um, a lot of my doctors, they've asked me for this kind of thing too, um, especially when I worked in emergency critical care and I had a lot of interns with me. They really appreciated stuff like this. Um, I guess might have even kind of somewhat changed over time too, just to kind of break things down, but we can really do a lot of different things with stuff. It doesn't have to be one specific item. Um, so just know like uh, rodenoside toxicity things, even auto transfusion is a really good option too. So um, by using the same blood, you know, it's just the blood isn't bad that they have. So, um, okay, so let's get into typing. All right, so um, canine typing. All right, so DEA 1.1. So DEA is nothing more than dog erythrocyte antigens. All right, so it's nothing fancy, um, but DEA 1.1 is what we test for in our hospitals. Um, then you guys can actually send out and test for additional things if you're doing a dog or a donor program in your hospital too. Um, there are at least 13 known antigens and they're always looking at additional things too. 
Um, and then about 60% of our dogs are DEA 1.1 negative, which makes them universal donors. All right. Now they could be DEA 1.1 negative and then also four as well, still makes them universal. All right. It's all about being DEA 1.1 negative. Okay, because DEA 1.1 is what gives us the biggest issues with having the most reactions. All right, so that's why we care the most at testing at that level at the hospital. All right. Um, so there's no natural, like significant occurring antibodies, um, just like there are with um, cats. Um, now, like I said, some people think that the first transfusion is considered a freebie, but we do need to, we can do a better job if we're actually doing a typing and a cross match because Cross-matching means that we're essentially doing a transfusion in a test tube first before we just do it in a in our patient, okay? So just because there's no significant natural occurring antibody doesn't mean that it won't actually happen. And we don't want to cause um, a hemolytic reaction and... It, that transfusion only lasts that patient for maybe two or three days. So it's always better and best practice to still do that cross match, if that makes sense. All right. So if you do hear people say, well, you know, the first one's a freebie, it's like not really like nothing in life is free, right? We know that. So it's it's still better practice to do a cross match. It doesn't take that much time. Um, and if it were my pet, I would 100% want someone to cross match it rather than having to do, you know, a second transfusion just because we didn't want to spend an extra 15 minutes doing a cross match, right? Um, so always do a cross match unless, unless, unless it's a stat and we need to like throw a like unit. And I don't mean literally throw, but you know, put a unit in like right away because that patient's dying. Um, so I have this like nice little picture here of if we have a donor who is 1.1 positive, that recipient gets positive blood. Okay. So 1.1 positive um, gets, oops, I'm going all over. Um, so if that recipient is 1.1 positive, we need to have a 1.1 positive donor, okay? If we have a recipient that is um, 1.1 negative, um, they need that negative blood. But if we have a donor who is 1.1 negative, we can also give them universal, okay, to that 1.1 positive. So we, we have a lot of like people in practice who try to only carry 1.1 negative units because they can give it to anyone, right? Universal blood. However, it's really hard to just carry negative blood um, all the time because we do have, you know, 40% of our dogs that have DEA 1.1 positive. Like I, my dog, she was a blood donor and um, she was 1.1 positive. So the hospital that, that did blood collection, they weren't going to just deny her because she had good blood. You know, she wanted, we wanted her to be a blood donor. So And she was used a lot. <laughs> so, um, yes. Quick question: the because I also have vet tech prep and one that, and one of the questions that I keep coming across something about like the cross, like minor cross match consists of like the recipients' red blood cells and the donor plasma. Yeah. Like, 
how to like I never really understood like how does that even yeah, work we're gonna it's, get to that yeah. oh okay gotcha yeah um so blood typing have, if have any of you guys done blood typing yeah. yep yep okay which one have you guys done the rapid vet h one this guy or this quick test okay the quick vet test h, like in school <laughs> this guy in school right maybe and then this one in practice so this one is a lifesaver in practice compared to this one, because this one is all about, um, this one's super old, old, old school. <laughs> it's very old. But wh why I like to show it to you is that what you may see, um, you know, this one's easy to read because you can see that there's a glutination. It's matching the positive control. So saying that whatever it matches, right? So if it didn't show a glutination and it looked like the negative, then this would have been 1.1 negative, right? But sometimes it's so hard to read. It can be really hard to read. And so that's where um, human error can come in. And especially with cats, there was a lot of human error. People would be like, well, is there a glutination there? Because it'd be like A and B there. And they're like, well, is this cat AB? No, it can't be because it's so rare and blah, blah, blah. So it was, it was really difficult to just make sure that we were right, you know, where here it's like a pregnancy test almost. We would always joke that you get the pregnancy test. So you have your control and so that control better pop up because otherwise we did something wrong. And then here's the test. So if it shows up that there's a line there, then that means that, yes, it's DEA 1.1 positive. And if there's no line there, then it's negative, right? Um, and then you can save these. It has the, the little plastic thing there if you want to save it. We would have like batches and batches of these. I don't know why we... Just save them for a long period of time. Honestly, I wish they just like took a picture of it and put it in the medical record or whatever. But like, I don't know. I think we just save everything in veterinary medicine. So whatever. Um, and then you have like a card that you write on too of saying what they actually are. So you can put it in the record. Um, so to me, I think this is just awesome. Super, super awesome. Um, so I'm glad you guys have seen both. Okay. Um, and then, all right. So feline typing. All right. So we go on the AB system. Okay. So people like to try to say that it's a little bit more like humans. It sort of is, but not quite. Um, sure. It's like human humans because we, it's letters. I don't know. Um, so, um, we have a, B, A, B, and then MYC, which is actually an allo antibody or yeah, antibody, um, which is rare, but it's something that we just have to be like cautious of. Um, again, no universal types. Keeping in mind though, that 90% of our domestic short hairs and domestic long hairs are going to be a type A. Okay. However, as we know, like a lot of our cats are some type of mixed breed, right? Now, of course, our more exotic breeds um, or purebred cats are going to be more type Bs, of course, right? And type B cats are, you know, harder to find for, um, for blood donating. So to put in context, I had a ragdoll cat who ragdolls are a mix of a, a Siamese breed, essentially. And of course, he was type B, right? Um, and he was going to be a blood donor. So I was like, that's cool. We'll actually have a type B cat. You know, that's awesome. Um, now, what was really sad was that we actually had a cat that came in um, and it was in oxygen because it couldn't breathe, obviously, because it had a low PCV. And when we did the typing for it, it came out that it was a B. Okay. Um, so it was really hard because we really wanted to give 
AB blood if we could find it. Um, but we couldn't get it. So in, in just being safe, we actually gave at the time oxyglobin was still around. Um, we actually gave um, oxyglobin first. Um, and then we were actually able to find a unit of AB blood. Okay, so we could still give type A blood. However, we we do risk the chance of of having um, a reaction um, to a cat that, um, how should I say this? We do risk cats with AB having a reaction to type A blood because cats that have B, that type B anywhere in their blood, not liking that A if that makes sense. Um, so we wanna try to avoid it as much as possible, even though we really can give it, um, but we we just try not to, okay? Um, so remember, they do have that naturally natural occurring antibodies in their plasma. So we cannot do any re freebies for them. Okay, so it is very, very important to do a typing and a cross match for them for every transfusion. All right, um, so we have this little uh, chart here for you guys, um, which is really nice and easy. Um, so again, um, if we are going to do a a transfusion, we can give red blood cells only for that AB cat because remember that antibody is in that plasma. Um, so the A can go to that AB cat. So you have to be really careful. Um, otherwise we can give AB, okay? Um, B goes straight to B, okay? Um, now, that was before we knew of xenotransfusions of the dog stuff. So we could have totally done that, but we didn't know it at the time, right? So a lot has come about since then. I want to say that was probably back in like, oh, I'm dating myself, 2007 maybe that, that all happened. So, okay. So feline typing, very similar, right? We're, we're looking for here which one of these is going to agglutinate and that's going to be our type okay so in this case if we see any type of agglutination in any of these then that's what it is so in that case we were we saw agglutination in the type a and the type b but again it could be a little bit of agglutination that you can barely see and then if it's more agglutination in here so say it looks like this it doesn't matter it's still a b so that's where human error comes in right so that's where i really like this because it it reduces at least human error so okay so cross matching all right um, so transfusion reactions can be fatal and this is why it's, you know, so, so important that we do a good job with these. I love honestly giving transfusions because you can um, see animals perk up, um, pretty quickly with transfusions. Um, so that's why I like it. I think that people sometimes, especially when they're first doing that, they're really scared to do them. Um, but you know, as long as you guys are being safe with it and being, you know, as clean as possible and that type of thing like this makes them feel so much better so um but the cross match procedure right so i tried to break it down so obviously don't pay attention to all the wording here but you're gonna have um obviously different samples so you're gonna have your your patient's blood right in an edta tube and then you're going to have your donor's blood in an EDTA tube, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to spin those tubes down um, to separate the plasma and the red blood cells, all right? And so once you spin them down, you're going to separate all the plasma and the red blood cells from those tubes. So you kind of create um, four different tubes for everything. So you'll have your 
patient's plasma, your patient's red blood cells, and then your, your donor's plasma and donor's red blood cells. Okay. So you've separated everything. All right. And label everything. So, you know, and, and that type of thing. All right. So what you want to do. So this is for your major cross match. All right. So your major cross match is that you are taking your donor's red blood cells. Okay. And you're going to make a little wash because what you want to do is you want to wash off any additional like plasma that might be still on those uh, red blood cells. All right. And you are going to put um, two, 0.2 milliliters of that, those red blood cells in four. 0.8 milliliters of saline. Okay. And you can mix it. Now you could also do, I just made it into five mils total of fluid, but you could do any amount that you want. It, it doesn't matter as long as it equals that. Right. So I've done it too with 0.1 mils into um, 2.4, you know, so that equals the same ratio. That's fine. Okay. So what you're going to do is that's your donor red blood cell wash, okay? So once you make your donor red blood cell wash, okay, so you're going to rinse it, you're going to agitate it, meaning just turn it upside down, all of that. Okay, you've washed off all of those red blood cells, all right? Now you're going to take your patient's um, plasma and you're going to put that plasma into your controls, okay? So you've now labeled um, four sterile no additives as you have a control, a cold temperature one, a room temperature one, and a body temperature, okay? So essentially your control is just sitting there. It's not gonna do anything. Um, you're going to place 0.1 mils of your recipient plasma into the three tubes. Okay. And then 0.1 of the donor washed red blood cells into the three tubes as well. All right. So you're going to incubate those tubes for 15 minutes. All right. So essentially your cold can go in the refrigerator the room temperature one can just sit out and then body temperature, I would just, you know, put in my pocket or do whatever, put it close to your body. Okay. And then after that 15 minutes, you're going to centrifuge that down onto the lowest speed setting, which is usually your urine speed setting. All right. And then you're going to evaluate it. And what you do is you pull it out and it should look like this. All right. If there's any hemolysis in in there. Um, so if you see that this is pink in any way, or there's what we call a little button, if your button isn't nice and pretty like that, then it doesn't, it's not a good cross match. All right. But that's not it. So this is a gross examination of your um, cross match. Okay. From there, what you're going to do is you're going to microscopically look at it after that. So you are going to mix it up. So it's basically, I'm ruining it again. And then you're going to take a little drop of it and put it on a slide. And then you're going to look at it under the microscope and look for agglutination or any type of homolysis, right? So mostly agglutination is what you're looking for under the slide. If you see any agglutination, then it's not a good cross match. Okay, so I've seen it where everything looks pretty good on here. And then I look at it under the microscope and there's agglutination everywhere. Okay, so then you say microscopically there's agglutination and I don't feel comfortable giving this to my patient. I'm going to do another cross match on another unit and it looks perfect with that other unit. Where maybe someone else had just would look at it as grossly and say, yep, that looks good and give it. And then later on, we see that that patient has a fever and um, maybe that unit doesn't last very long and we have to uh, give another unit later, or maybe that patient has some vomiting or whatever. So 
it's definitely worth it to do all of that, these steps ahead of time. Okay. So again, that's our major cross match. Okay. Now, what do you think is the minor cross match? The minor cross match is super, super easy because remember, this is the donor red blood cells with the recipient or your patient's plasma. So what do you think you have left, right? Remember we 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 um separated out four parts. So what's the minor? Albumin. Sorry, I missed what you said. Albumin? Not the albumin. Just the whole blood? Platelets? No. What were our four parts that we separated out to begin with? Control, cold, room temperature, and body temperature? No. The donor's um, plasma. Okay. And then we're going to use the recipient's blood this I mean, sorry. Yeah, the blood this time. Yeah, the recipient's uh, red blood cells. Very good. And the donor's plasma. Very good. So remember in the beginning, I said we have, we're separating out the recipient's red blood cells and their plasma. And then also we're separating out the donor's red blood cells and the donor's plasma. So we did the major cross match with the donor's red blood cells and the recipient's plasma. And we set aside the other two, right? Many people do just the major cross match and call it a day, okay? A full cross match procedure includes the major cross match and the minor cross match. So you can do both at the exact same time. Just make sure you have it all labeled. Okay. So keep that in mind. If they ask you, all right, if we're doing a minor cross match, what does that include? Okay, just keep in mind, okay, my major cross match. If you know your major cross match from the back of your hand, all right, my, write it down. The major cross match includes the donor's red blood cells and the recipient plasma. Then your minor cross match has to be the other two that are left over. Okay. Don't make it too complicated. It's not that complicated. All right. Okay, so interpretation of it, right? So agglutination, which one of these are agglutination? The one to the right. This guy? Yeah. Mm, anyone else? Top left. Top left, okay. So... A glue nation looks like if you smashed a bunch of grapes together, like you just stepped on them all. Okay. Now, what's this? Hemolysis? No, not hemolysis. Rouleau, Rouleau formation. formation. Good. Rouleau formation. Okay. Good. So, what is Rouleau um, normal in? Horses. Horses and? Cats. Cats, very good. Good, good, good. So if we see this in cats or horses, don't worry too much about it, right? Don't worry too much, okay? If we see this on our, on our cross match, then we go, yeah, I'm thinking this is, I got to redo it. It sucks, right? Oh, wow, I just did all that work. But it's way better than doing that to our patient. And, you know, and spending how much money, you know, you can kill that patient, number one. But even if it doesn't kill our patient, you know, 
we're going to put our animal through all of that. And maybe what happens when that pet parent goes, you know what, I, I can't afford to do a whole other transfusion. Now we have to euthanize. That's pretty bad. So just keep that in mind. Like, that's why we need to do our best efforts and do gold standard. Okay. All right. So dosing, I'm not going to get too much into the dosing because, um, you know, these are things you guys can always look up, right? Um, one kind of cool thing is if you guys are ever looking at for packed red blood cells, because a lot of times you guys are going to do a lot of packed red blood cells, I feel like it's one mil per kg for each desired 1% that you want to increase. Okay. Again, is that a VTNE thing? Eh. But it's just something to kind of keep in your in your pocket. Um, remember though, that all of our transfusions, we don't want more than four hours. Okay. Some of them you'll see here that it says four to six, this has changed over the years and then I just need to change it, but we want them over four hours. Why? Why four hours? Why can't we have a blood transfusion go for 10 hours? Is that because the blood doesn't really last that long? Like the fresh blood and whatnot? Mm, I mean, it opens it, it up for bacteria. Ooh, good. Yes. Bacteria growth, right? We don't want that. So if we can give it as quick as we possibly can without being dangerous to that patient. Awesome. Right. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so four hours is like our, our awesome mark. Very good. And then once we hook up that patient to that blood transfusion, we don't disconnect them. So say that patient's like crying and whining, like they got to go outside. You take that blood transfusion with them right? You don't disconnect them ever because again, it opens it up to bacteria growth every time you would disconnect them. Okay. Whenever you touch that blood product, um, you have to wear gloves. Okay. Um, because those bags are, when you touch the bag, the bag is kind of a weird touch to it. It's a semi-permeable bag. So we want to make sure that we are staying as clean as possible with those bags. All right. So, oh, look, here's me handling blood products. Okay. So stay sterile. So if you ever need to split a bag, so this is kind of, um, an interesting part. So when I, um, had my dog, uh, she was about 40 pounds. And in order to be a blood donor, you had to be, um, if you guys ever read additional information or have your dog become a blood donor, typically in order to be a blood donor, your dog has to be over 50 pounds and she was only 40 pounds. And so I was like, nope, she wants to be a blood donor. So let's figure something out. So she actually became the first dog in our program that was a half unit um, blood donor, which meant that she donated 250 mils um of blood instead of the 500 mils of blood or it's actually like 473 or whatever but anyway um and at first they were like we don't really know if we're gonna need like only 250 mils you know how many little dogs actually need blood a lot right so it actually worked out really well so um but before that we had to actually split a lot of bags for those little tiny dogs and as you guys know if blood sits out more than four hours, it's exposed to bacteria, right? So what happens is, is that instead of just like leaving a bag out and saying, okay, well, they only need this time around maybe 200 mils and the bag is 500 mils. What we're going to do is split the bag and then put the rest back in case they need that bag later. Okay. But in order to split that bag, you have to be really sterile about it. Okay, so that's where it was really nice to be able to have maybe a little bit bigger dog, but not big enough to do a whole unit. Um, and that way we didn't have to split as many bags, if that makes sense. So if you ever decide maybe have a smaller-ish dog um, that they can't do a full unit, 
kind of see and talk them into, hey, can we do a half unit? I think they have done a lot more of that kind of stuff. Um, make sure you follow storage and expiration dates. Okay, so units that are over that 35, 36 days, we cannot use them. They're no good anymore. Um, and then um, storage wise, they have to be in their own refrigerator for blood. Okay. Um, so that they're not getting exposed to other things. Right. I have been where, where people have stored blood with food, with chemotherapy, with all different things, vaccines, all of that. Again, because they're semi-permanent bags, they can be exposed to all of that stuff. And that's just not safe. Um, wear gloves, stay sterile, don't crush the bag. I've seen people who, because the fresh frozen plasma is stored in a freezer, they want it to thaw really quickly. So they'll actually like squish the bag and do all that. You're actually squishing all the good nutrients in that bag and things that we need to give that pet. And so it is very, very important not to crush the bags. Um, gently invert the bag or units at least every hour, especially when you're giving them because um, things will, will actually separate in the bag. So we don't want to like give, you know, all of one part of that bag at one time. So just invert it every so often and then follow warming instructions. So if you warm bags, um, I personally don't, um, put them in warm water baths, but there are some people that do never warm them above 98.6 degrees. Um, the reason they say 98.6 degrees is that we follow the human standards of 98.6, so that's body temperature. Um, but they also don't recommend anymore um, the water baths, um, typically, just because we most people don't have appropriate water baths to begin with. So if you're putting them in like a food dish that's a water bath and you double bag it, like that's typically not a a, a appropriate water bath for them. There are actually um, blood like appropriate baths that you can buy for them. Um, but if you're doing a cross match and, and uh, blood typing a cross match, when you're doing it, I would just leave them out on the counter. And by the time I'm done, they're actually appropriate temperature. And also um, while you're giving the blood, it actually warms up by the time it gets to your patient anyway right? So you're actually fine. I mean, the fluids that we give our patients, the crystalloid fluids that we give our patients, they're pretty cold too, and our patients are fine. So um, again, stay sterile and then use appropriate size catheters. So does this mean that you have to place a 20 or 18 gauge catheter in your patient? No, not necessarily, but you shouldn't place a 24 either. So um, splitting bags. So I'd like to just show you guys some of the, uh, stuff that they have. Um, so this is the centrifuge I was talking about. So it's a nice big centrifuge. We had one of these. It was pretty cool. And then it just like separates out your pack red blood cells and your plasma there. So again, it doesn't mean that pack red blood cells are a better type of blood transfusion. It's just what is appropriate for what you're actually treating for, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, when you, if you guys are ever doing the blood collection, just remember again, because you know, um, one mil equals one gram. So if you're using a gram scale, so that's how we would know how much we've actually drawn out. Okay. Um, if we've also split a bag, um, we were able to split the bag and save it for no more than five days. So once you've already like opened up that bag, we could save it for no more than five days after it was split. Right. Okay, so the setup process. So determine what we actually need, what unit is best. Hold the unit that's going to expire first because again, we don't want to like use the one that's gonna expire last and then leave the ones that are expiring right then and there. Um, and then log your blood unit the way that you guys appropriate log it um, with in your hospital, okay? And then um, this just went over exactly what we were talking about before. Um, so you're going to prime your line and everything. So you're not going to start your blood transfusion, you know, at the highest rate as possible. You want to start that patient off slow, 
So connect your patient first and do a one mil per kick per hour. So it's it really start them out little to make sure that they're able to handle that unit first. Um, and you want to do a compatible fluid pump that actually can handle blood and not like crush the blood while it's giving it. Um, there are a lot of practices that do drip rates instead. They don't actually use pumps. I actually went to drip rates as well for a long time um, just because I wanted to make sure that we weren't crushing any of that blood. And then for monitoring. Um, so monitoring wise, so we want to monitor them at first um, every five minutes to make sure that they are good as long as they're doing fine. Um, at that 15 minute mark, you just slowly increase them. Okay. So then you have that one mil per keg per hour rate, increase them to half of their final rate for about 15 minutes and then go to the 30 minute mark, which is they're going to be their final rate. Okay. So remember that we're going to be doing this over four hours. All right. There are some people that were like, no, I'm going to check them every five minutes. Who wants to have their temperature checked every five minutes? Right. So be mindful as long as they're doing fine. Don't like actually check their temperature every five minutes. We can just monitor them from afar and don't increase their stress level and stuff unless you have to. Okay. Now, once the transfusion's in, been completed, we can flush their line. It says only, again, this is a little bit older, only with 0.9% sodium chloride. And then I'm going to add in here or, um, and or, uh, um, plasma light. Okay, those are the only two fluids you can use. Okay, you can't do LRS, you can't do Norm R or anything like that, but you can only do sodium chloride or plasma light. All right. Um, once the transfusion is complete, disconnect your patient and evaluate them, make sure they're good, give them any medications they may have missed over that time, walk them outside. Um, you can give them food, anything like that. During their transfusion, though, um, don't give them any medications, don't give them any food, because we want to make sure that if they have a reaction to something that is due to the transfusion, okay? So if they vomit, we want to make sure that it was due to the transfusion, not because you fed them, not because you gave them water, not because you gave them Batril or anything like that. Um, uh, and then, why, yes. um, sorry, why can you only flush the line with the sodium chloride or the plasma light? Like um, yeah, so um, we don't want, we want to make sure that um, it is compatible, obviously, with that. We don't want any precipitation for those things. Um, so plasma light is very similar to, obviously, uh, plasma light is very similar to actually the, like, pH of blood and um, all of, and, and just being a plasma. And then sodium chloride is just straight saline. So we don't want to actually give anything that is going to precipitate, if that makes sense. Okay. I have a question. I know we've gone over this before, but we had a patient come in and they just had like a barium study done. Yeah. And um, I saw that the doctor grabbed the sodium chloride fluids. Okay. And I just remember us talking about the fluids for um previously and I was like wait does she want to use that <laughs> okay for like a hot and she had the dog on like a 200 mils like mil rate um so I was like I couldn't remember what the reason was though that I thought oh maybe that was a bad idea that's interesting I mean it's not like a bad thing of maybe why she put them on sodium chloride. I guess I would have, um, I'd be interested to know that it was a barium series. Like what else made her think why sodium chloride or if she just grabbed it? Yeah, that's actually, I asked her, but she said, that's the first thing that I saw. And I was oh, like, oh, okay. 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 But I couldn't remember if there was something negative about it, isn't it? No, Is not necessarily. One... No, it's not the one that stays in the vascular space longer. 
No. I, am I wrong about that? Okay. Yeah, no. It's still a crystalloid, so it's still going to, like, help with hydration and stuff like that. So that's totally fine. It's still an isotonic fluid, so that's fine. Um, I just, I wondered if, you know, if it's essentially, like, a patient who's having, like, vomiting and diarrhea, like, maybe they would have benefited from, like, some additional potassium that might have been in there if it was like a um I, I don't know it for like plasma light or norma or whatever but I mean there's not that much potassium I guess in it and she could have always supplemented if she needed it so it's just, that's a little okay. interesting but I mean it's good catch on your part to just be like why did you do that or, yeah so I guess there's not really it's not a negative thing. I don't know. I no, just for no. some reason in the hospital, we keep it in a separate drawer and like nobody ever uses it. To right. Be honest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like we would use it every once in a while. Like if we didn't, have, if we ran out of something, right. Or like, or we had like an Addisonian crisis came in or something to that nature, but not like it's a weird oopsie kind of thing, I guess. So. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's a good call out. Um, but in this case, it's good for like obviously like flushing purposes because it's it's nice so that nothing else is going to precipitate out. And we have to remember, like for blood transfusions, there's other things in it because with blood, there's gonna be um uh anticoagulant in there. That that's what we don't want to precipitate. If that makes sense. Because granted, we know like blood isn't going to precipitate, but there's anticoagulant in there that could potentially precipitate with whatever else, like LRS or something. Um, okay, so transfusion monitoring, right, is that we want to monitor for fever. That's typically the first thing that we'll see. That's why we do that right away in the beginning. And your zero minute is where you're getting your baseline. So you always want to do like a good TPR and everything like that before you even start your blood transfusion. Look for vomiting. Um, look for facial swelling, uticaria, which is hive. So making sure that you know like these words as well puritis which is itching also look for like um them trying to itch at the um iv catheter site too just kind of note those types of things right away and just kind of keep an eye on it um more serious transfusion reactions like collapse seizures loss of consciousness death um it didn't happen to me personally. I feel like horrible about it, but I don't know if anyone, this was many, many years ago, like 10 years ago, but, um, when canine albumin first came out, um, there was a really bad batch of it that came out. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but, um, they had certain lot numbers and all of that. Well, of course, the place that I worked at had a bad batch, the bad lot number for it. And a person I was working with, it was his first time doing a transfusion. I was like, oh, no, canine albumin, it's it's super easy. You know, it's so much better than doing human albumin. Like, you know, just kind of keep an eye on them or whatever. And I feel horrible because he's doing it and all of a sudden his patient like collapses and having a seizure and then ends up dying. And he was like, I don't know what I could have done differently. Like, you know, I was watching them and I'm like, I, I have no earthly idea. Well, it turns out that it was the bad lot number of it. And we had to like um, send in an adverse event and all of that. So I felt really bad because I assured him that things were going to be fine and it wasn't, but, um, yeah. So obviously when you have those adverse events, hopefully you don't, um, there's adverse event, um, logs to also fill out and send in too. So has anyone ever had to fill out any of those for certain things for any drugs or anything like that? We Nothing. had a actual reaction to pro heart 12. Mm. Our Yes, really crazy. And they ended up paying for it was actually a co-worker's dog. 
they yeah. paid for all of the hospitalization for the dog yeah. too. Yeah. No, they're really, they're actually really good about any of that stuff. Actually pro heart. Cause I've had a couple things with pro heart um, where like the animals have actually gotten heartworm a couple, like two um, that mm. ended up getting a heartworm um, and they've paid for everything. So interesting. Yeah. yeah. My, Coworker wouldn't even like administer it for like months after that because she was so yeah. paranoid about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and there's the thing is, is like though how I saw it too was the two animals that I had um that had it, they were adopted animals prior to and then got pro heart. So mm-hmm. they couldn't tell if they actually had heartworm. Yeah. Like prior to getting the pro heart injection, which is kind of sad, but they still paid for it anyway. So I, I kind of appreciated the fact that they were like, you know, we'll just do the right thing and help these people out. So. Yeah, it's not, I was like, oh, that's interesting because, you know, usually it's like, oh, you don't want to admit guilt, but they were just honestly just like, yeah, we, it's so rare that, you know, right. we feel for this person and it was, yeah, it was pretty yeah, no, absolutely. So, so yeah, I think on our level, um, knowing to fill out those adverse events or reaching out and reaching out to the company, a lot of the um, companies have veterinarians on staff. So you guys can talk through the cases with them, whether it's your veterinarian that talks to them at my hospital, they were like, you just talk to them. <laughs> you just talk to them because we have so much other stuff to do. And then you get the recommendations and stuff. So that was nice because the veterinarians are great there. And they're like, this is our recommendation. We're happy to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll let the doctors know and we'll keep you posted. And then they give you a case number. So, you know, it's always important to let them know because their job is to get all these cases um, and so that they can do their due diligence to make their product better in the future. If we don't report that stuff, they're never going to know. So, um, so complications for it. Okay. So we have transfusion reactions, rather right. Hemolytic meaning that after we have a transfusion given, we're going to check those PCVs and stuff like that. Um, and we get a baseline right afterwards of saying, okay, we give this transfusion, maybe we moved up to 36%. We're keeping an eye on it. And then maybe it goes down to 22 again. That means that it's a hemolytic transfusion reaction. Okay. Makes sense. Um, if it's staying stable, that's awesome, right? That's fa- fantastic. However, sometimes we have non-hemolytic um, transfusion reactions, which means that that's all of these, right? So um, we could have acute lung injury, being that, hey, maybe we've fluid overloaded them, maybe a clot went there, that type of thing, okay? Infectious, um, we try our very best to not um, have anything like that, like bacterial, viral would be really bad. So to minimize that before we actually um, collect blood from our donors, they're heavily screened um, and they get exams and all of that from our doctors. They get um, yearly blood work, all of that. Um, also parasitic. So remember when I talked about my type B ragdoll cat. Um, well, when we did the blood work on him, um, he was actually, I got him as a, a rescue cat. Um, and even though he was a type B cat, um, when we did all his blood work, he came back with, at the time was called hemobartonella or mycoplasma, as you guys know, right? So what is mycoplasma? Or he, what did you guys know? It's hem, maybe hemobartonella. What is that? Anyone? Blood parasite? Blood parasite. It's a bacteria, right? Oh. It's, a, it's a blood parasite. Yeah. So how how does a cat get this blood parasite? Please. Mm. Fleas, right? 
Yes. So when I got him, he didn't have any fleas on him. So this must have been obviously something that he had prior to was treated for. I'm guessing he was probably treated for fleas when he came to the rescue. And then I just didn't know about like he was totally fine when I got him, like didn't show any symptoms or anything. And I probably would have never known he had hemobartina unless I actually did all of this blood work and stuff to for him to be a blood donor. So I ended up treating him for hemobartanella with doxycycline for like six weeks. Um, we retested him for hemobartanella and he was seemed fine and all of that. But because of that, he could not be a blood donor. Like they automatically kick you out. Okay. Um, which is a good thing. We we don't want to take any chances for giving anything to a pet. So um, same thing when it comes to like patients who even are exposed to Lyme disease um, or anything like that. Like if they come back with Lyme or anything, they're automatically taken out of the program. So other things are like hypocalcemia or hypomagnesemia. I, ha I hate saying that. Why do you think that they might end up having hypocalcemia or hypomagnesemia. Uh, parathyroid problem? Is that what? No, mm, no think um, about what's in the blood. Things. What's in your blood transfusions? So remember we talked about, we have our red blood cells, our, our plasma, our, um, our thrombocytes, um, all of that. But in order for that stuff not to clot, right, we're going to have to put in an anticoagulant. Yeah. And sometimes some of our patients get a lot of blood transfusions. Okay. And so when we do that, um, it ends up that we give maybe too much anticoagulant over time. And so that can pull out a lot of our calcium and magnesium. magnesium. Okay. So we just have to be mindful that we might have an, uh, we, we might have a weird imbalance with our electrolytes just due to um, the anticoagulant that, that we're giving them to. So if we have to give a lot, so due to like acute, you know, uh, hemorrhage or stuff like that. All right. So that's, that's the end of it, but that we have gold standard care. So we just don't give blood typically. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? Is that helpful? For the vt &E, would you say that some of the basic stuff you might want to know is the cross-matching between dogs and cats? I mean, we didn't even go into like large animal. What's the, <laughs> can you, do blood transfusions on large animals happen often? No. <laughs> no. The, yeah, the big so. things that you need to know for the vt &E are handling of blood, um, mm -hmm. the cross-matching, typing, um, the different types of blood products. Uh. Um and um also like what what should you warm your blood to right um yeah 98.6 right like your oh 96 okay yeah um also um, 
let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, um, which one has a antibody or, you know, which one has antigens and antibodies? Which one's that? The Cat, cats. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So dogs have antigens on their red blood cells. Mm -hmm. And then cats have antibodies and antigens. Um, so <clears throat> let me, let me try to show you how I, I envision this maybe. I don't know why my document turns black, but it did. Okay. So how I envision it is that why is it black? Okay, well, I guess we're doing it like this today, like backwards. Um, so if I have a red blood cell, okay, so this is my dog, red blood cell. And how I envision it, right, is that a dog red blood cell has a max of 13 antigens. Okay, so that means that on the red blood cell, they can have these little tiny antigens that can be on there all around it. Okay. I don't know if you're drawing something, but it's not visible to me. Oh, really? Your screen is paused. What? Why is it paused? Let me see. Share screen. Do you see my screen now? Yeah, I can see it now. Okay. So we have all these like little antigens. Like I said, I don't know why it's showing it in black, but it's just being weird today. Okay. So... Depending on it, it says, okay, well, um, we have DEA 1.1 pop, you know, it's DEA 1.1. So there's that. And so hopefully our patient, right, is DEA 1.1 positive to go to our patient. So if it doesn't, if our patient is negative, so say our patient is negative, and we give this positive blood to that patient, it's going to go, oh, we don't match. That's that's not good. We're, we're probably going to have some sort of reaction, whether it's a fever or whatever. All right. Um, so essentially, if that positive one isn't there and it's negative and it goes to that negative one, then it goes, okay, we're, we're free of maybe having that reaction and that's good. Okay. Even if it has maybe that four or whatever that's there, maybe the four only, you know, has minimal reactions if it's there. So it's not that big of a deal. Now with cats, on the other hand, cats have, you know, antibodies that live in the plasma. So it might have this like little antibody here, antibody here, whatever. So maybe this red blood cell matches perfectly with the red blood cell in the patient. But if these guys are going to react, that's not good. So that's what happens with our AB cats. So maybe this A blood matches with the A here, but this part isn't going to match and that's not good. And then they have a reaction. So that's where sometimes we'll, we're able to give dog blood. So we talked about dog blood because dog blood, um, we can give this like little dog blood here and it has its own little stuff, but it doesn't have things that this cat blood recognizes. And so 
it goes, okay, we're not communicating, so I can't react. So now we're giving at least red blood cells that can essentially give oxygen to my patient in order to be just a Band-Aid until you create your own red, red blood cells. And there's no antibodies here because dogs don't, don't do that. So that's kind of the cool part. If only we knew that kind of stuff, you know, years ago, that would have probably saved a lot of cats' lives, but. Um, so the big things to really know, at least, are your types, okay? What types you can give. Your different cross matches. So again, your major cross match, your minor cross match. Um, the handling of blood products. Um, how long to give your blood products over. And then when are we going to actually transfuse a patient? It's not based on number. It's based on clinical signs, right? And... Remember, or with erythropoietin is important. So, um, so say you have a renal failure cat. Why is it a renal failure cat? Or I'm sorry, not why, but why why are they not producing red blood cells? Because they are lacking erythropoietin. Okay, and then what are you monitoring while a patient is getting a blood transfusion? Does that help? Yes. <clears throat> what was the, you start out with one mil per keg. Per hour. Per hour. Yep. Sure. Um, so... A side note, um, can we go over CPR? Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, yeah. And just, yeah, quickly, whatever. In a, in a nutshell, yeah. Just, yeah, in a nutshell, basically. Sure. Um, so, let's see. Okay, so we have two types of CPR, right? So we have um, basic life support and then advanced life support. So what does basic life support mean? Isn't it just doing um, chest compressions like... Um, I guess how we have it set up is the C like CPR two is the advanced, it's like the more like the open chest. Um, but I think it's I don't quite sure. <laughs> okay, so basic life support is that we have chest compression, so that's one part. What's the other part of basic life support? Ventilation. Ventilation. Okay, good. So we're giving chest compressions and ventilation, having airway, all of that, right? So that's our basic life support. So anything that we could essentially do for that pet, um, if we weren't in a hospital setting, say you're in a park, right? Like that's as much as you can possibly do, right? Ventilating for that patient and doing some chest compressions, okay? So as are chest compressions, how many chest compressions are you giving per minute? 80 to 120. 
Mm. Everyone agree? Does it depend on the size of the animal? No. No. Is it 200? Is it what? I'm sorry. Uh, 200? No. Hundred and twenty. Okay, hundred and twenty is part of it. <laughs> Anyone do recover training? I did. It's been too long since I did it though. Oh no. Okay. So it is a hundred to one hundred and twenty beats per minute. Okay, regardless of size. Right. So, what songs do you sing it to? I keep hearing the "Staying Alive." Staying alive, okay. There's there's a ton of different songs, but like staying alive is like your most common one. But I, then I hear a bunch of younger people like, I don't know that song. And I go, oh my gosh, how do you not know that song? <laughs> so yes, as long as it's something to those that rhythm, right? So 100 to 120 beats per minute, okay? Now ventilation. What, how many... How many breaths per minute? You can even do breaths per so many compressions. So it is eight to 10 breaths per minute or 30 compressions and then two breaths. So, or two breaths per 30 compressions. So you'll do 30 compressions and then two breaths and then 30 more compressions and then two breaths. Okay. So if you're by yourself. All right. All right, so then we have advanced life support. Um, actually, let's go back to basic life support. So if we are, are um, doing our chest compressions, we're gonna actually have our patients in certain positions, okay? So we did talk about how um, our chest compressions don't matter based on size, but where we do our compressions are based on size um, and shape of our patient. So if we um, have a smaller pet um, or we have a pet who is what's called keel chested, so like Dobermans or Great Danes and things like that, or it's a smaller pet, where do we do our chest compressions on those pets? You want them in lateral? Okay, so they're gonna be lateral. Um, and then where are our hands? That's the third and fourth rib. Okay, and actually upper. it's gonna be your, the fifth intercostal space, good. Okay. But okay. but over their cardiac, right? The That's actually called the cardiac pump method. So we are actually doing chest compressions right on their um right on their heart. Okay. So fifth intercostal space. Okay. So cheat method would be to take their elbow and push their elbow back, and it's right where their elbow meets. Okay. So fifth intercostal space. So it would be cats, small dogs, and then anything keel chested. So those like narrow chested animals. Okay. Now, if we have animals like labs, boxers, you know, bigger dogs that aren't keel chested. Okay. Where are we doing their chest compressions? They're in dorsal recumbency. No. No. That's a differentiate. Yes, that's no. going to be our barrel chested animals. Yeah. So we're talking labs. Boxers, um, Rottweilers, you know, those those bigger dogs.
So they're be lateral. They're well? going to be lateral. Good. But where are our hands going? Good question. So our hands are going to be at the thickest part of their chest. Okay. So it is actually going to go more like further back on their chest. So that thicker part of their chest. And this is called the thoracic pump method. So essentially we are hitting um, the, the bigger part and it's going to push up on their chest all the way to their heart. Okay. So we're going to use that momentum to hit their heart. All right. Because we're actually, they're, they're, chest is so thick that if we went right onto their heart, we wouldn't actually be able to hit their heart to do those chest compressions. So we're going to use that momentum of the thickest part of their chest to actually get um, that, you know, all of their organs and stuff to actually hit the heart. All right. Now we talked about barrel chested animals, barrel chested animals. We're going to actually put them in dorsal recumbency. Okay. Um, so barrel chested animals are Frenchies, our bulldogs, our pugs, Boston's, all of those guys. So they're very round chested. They're going to be in dorsal recumbency. And we're, where are we going to put our hands um, to do chest compressions? Is that on the apex of the heart? Yeah, so okay. you're going to actually do like on their sternum, okay? Yeah. So, yes, you are going to do um, just like humans, right? Uh, sternal compressions uh, on their chest. Very good. Okay. So when we do basic um, so life support, if that doesn't work, we're then moving to advanced life support. So you're not spending a ton of time with just doing basic life support. If you have means to do advanced life support, then you're going to go ahead and do that. So advanced life support, meaning we're placing an IV catheter. We're giving uh, medication for that. Um, we can then from there do blood work. We can look at um, an echo or ultrasound, right, to see if there's fluid there. Um, we can defibrillate. We're looking at, with monitoring equipment. We're doing all of those additional things. Okay. Now, typically, if you have a group of people, you want to have a good team there. So we want to typically have a team that's no more than five to six people, because if you have too many people, that can be like you're, you have a lot of people in the way. All right. So our team structure for that is that we have a leader a compressor, a ventilator, a recorder, and a drug handler. All right. So who typically is the leader? The one who monitors? The doctor. The doctor. The doctor. So oh. <laughs> the doctor, keep in mind, the doctor is probably going to be some, a person who is going to be running around, probably trying to call the owner um, and or going up front to talk to the owner or something like that. So the doctor is really not part of the CPR team. OK, now the doctor will probably come by and talk to you guys and give you guys um, instructions and stuff like that. But keep in mind that the leader is someone that has to be there all the time to facilitate and give instructions to. So the doctor is actually um, doing their own thing, okay? So as a leader, you need to have someone who is pretty, uh, pretty much in charge all the time. And then it's usually a team lead on the team. So whether it's your senior vet tech or something like that, um, that's pretty much your leader. So your doctor is probably going to be talking to that person a lot and giving those instructions so that that leader then can go, okay, this is what you want. I'm going to facilitate and give those instructions to everyone else. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, does that happen all the time? Probably not, but it should that because you're going to get better results that way. Okay. So your leader then when they get those instructions, all right, from your doctor. All right. So say your doctor says, okay, I want all of these meds given. I need this. I need that. We're going to do an ultrasound or whatever. Um, and then your doctor leaves, right? 
and to go to talk to the owner or go get something else or whatever. Then your leader is going to say, okay, I'm going to go get this. Can you guys do this? Can you do that? Whatever. Right. So they are facilitating all of that stuff. You'll have a compressor, um, the compressor and the ventilator, the recorder, drug handler. You guys may um, switch out quite often because the compressor is going to get tired after so often, right? Because the compressor is actually doing compressions for two minutes straight and it gets tiring really fast. So you guys may change the roles quite frequently. Okay. So the role of that team leader is to organize everyone and not to dictate, um, rapidly assign roles, and then just solicitate like, you know, and acknowledge input from the team, like by saying, all right, do you guys have any ideas what we can do next? Um, you know, someone might say, hey, do you want me to place that catheter and get some blood while I'm here? And they say, yeah, that's a great idea. Just hang on to it, you know, stuff to that nature. Um, and then intermittently summarize what, what we're actually accomplishing in that so that everyone knows where we're at. All right. So how do we recognize when a patient is, has arrested? That is probably one of the biggest things I've seen is that we self-doubt um, when a patient is has arrested, okay? A patient is unresponsive, maybe in a cage, um, happens a lot um, or something like that. And you're kind of going, is that patient okay? Is that patient not breathing? Um, and I've even done it myself where I'm like, mm, that patient doesn't look that right, you know? Or we even go to ourselves and say, I think that patient is kind of circling the drain or like something's going to happen in the next few minutes rather than just sitting there and going, I think that patient may not make it in the next couple of minutes rather than just letting it be, take that patient out. If you have a gut feeling that something's not right. Okay. Um, absence of breathing or agonal breathing doesn't count, but we should still do something about it. Right. Um, if they're agonal breathing, we need to to act fast because something's about to happen, okay? Um, absence of palpable pulses or um, anything like that. If you don't feel a pulse, that that means that, hey, something's not right with the blood pressure. They could still have a heart rate, but we need to start listening to the heart, okay? The first thing that we should do if that patient doesn't look right is not to feel a pulse. We need to listen to the patient, okay? Don't waste time trying to feel a pulse. Um, and then when in doubt, do you CPR? Okay. The, the worst thing that can happen is that you might break a rib, but you know how many, how often that happens? Less than 2% of the time. So it doesn't happen that often. Um, I've never broken a rib. I mean, I'm not really that strong, but like I've never broken any ribs, even on little patients. So Big thing is that ever since Recover came out, um, so I remember when Co Recover came out, but before that, a lot of people didn't actually have um, pre-stocked uh, areas like crash carts and stuff like that. But ever since Recover started, we've actually gotten a lot of people with pre-stocked areas and um, crash carts. So 80% of our general practices now have crash carts and 98% of our specialty practices have crash carts. So really, really cool um, that that we can have this stuff available because of the knowledge and, and stuff that they've gotten from Recover. Okay. Big problem areas though, is that many times they have missing equipment because people don't return it. Um, we don't stock it appropriately because we just didn't get to stocking it yet or defective equipment because maybe the, you know, laryngoscope fell and broke. Right. So we just need to make sure that that stuff gets put back and it's actually we're in working use. Um, if you guys have a crash cart, you probably have some sort of, you know, checklist there and available. So that's helpful. Um, making sure that when your crash cart is stocked, it's not overstocked. So when you stock it, it should be only stocked for one patient only and then restocked for the next patient, okay? You don't need to be overstocked because um, then you can't find anything, 
Okay. So then we need to know what the survival rate is for patients that arrest. Okay. So survival rate for dogs and cats um, is between four to nine percent, which does not include until discharge. So that means if a patient goes into arrest and we do CPR, the chance that we'll actually get them to come back from that one arrest is about four to nine percent. Okay. That does that doesn't mean anesthesia survival. That's just regular coming in maybe through ER, that type of thing. Okay. So four to nine percent. Not great. And that doesn't include till discharge. Okay. Now, survival rate of of until discharge is zero to three percent. So good chances. Not not great, right? Now, um, if we have a patient that arrests during anesthesia, the survival rate till discharge is 36 to 55 percent. So much better, right? Okay. Um, so keep that in mind. Okay. So um I had a quick question. Yeah. Is recover free? Um no. It's not, but I feel like they have it, they had it free for students during COVID. So you may want to look into if they That's have... how I took it. Okay. You is from COVID. Okay. But I wanted to pitch it to my practice manager because I think the surgery team should at least be one hundred percent. Yeah. I would talk to your talk to your hospital to see if they might cover it it's not horribly expensive if they would actually pay for it though you know what I mean like I mean they just paid for us all to become fear free oh yeah then if they'll do that then why wouldn't they fear free is expensive <laughs> yeah the whole it was like I don't know it was part of I don't know if it was part of the corporation or if it was aha uh -huh, but we had to have like it went from like just part of the team to the entire team unless they're trying to become fear free certified Hmm. as a practice you know because in order to be fear free at a practice like at practice level all of you guys have to be fear free certified but um I there's nothing against fear free um but recover saves lives exactly that's why I wanted to pitch it to my yeah like I had it I was certified I probably lapsed at this point yeah um and one of my other friends who I went to school with that works there is, was certified as well. Yeah. But so, I, I mean, I, I guess I would pitch it that way. Like it's like. nothing against fear free. I think there's a, a lot of really great um, information with fear free. Like I'm fear free elite. I did all of, all of it for like well over four years and, and all of that. But um, if you don't know stuff for recover, uh, your patients will die. Exactly. So I I think it's worth at least knowing and having people available to be able to do it. So it like just this conversation and then something else that happened this yeah. week kind of like hit home. It was not, there was absolutely nothing we could have done. It came in yeah. that way, but yeah, it was the first time I've ever seen an asphyxiation due to heart failure. Yeah. And to so, me, it's like, you just don't want to be <laughs> caught with your pants down, right? Like you'd want to be able to help your patients as, as much as you possibly can. The chances of your patients coming back are not great to begin with, but when you don't know what to do, the chances are zero. Exactly. And that's to me, negligence, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I definitely recommend it. So, um, so one uh, obviously you want to get airway for, for me, when you guys are doing chest compressions before you're doing chest compressions on a patient that is already arrested, it's really important to practice doing lateral intubation on patients. Like when you are, are intubating like surgery patients, right? So get used to practicing on patients that are doing fine in lateral. Okay. Because it's so easy, right. To intubate patients, um, when they're sternal, but then when you're having to to do intubation in lateral recumbency in a really stressful environment like CPR, it makes it really difficult. So start getting used to practicing in lateral, like while they're, 
you know, stable and for surgery so that when there's an issue and they are rest, you feel a little bit more comfortable being able to do that. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, for breathing. All right. So our number one choice is have them intubated in oxygen because they get hundred percent oxygen. So our idea here is that we need to preserve their brain. Okay. Um, we don't need brain damage, right? Um, if we cannot intubate them, the next best thing is to put them, hook them up to the anesthesia and put them on a hundred percent, or I should say anesthesia machine and hook them up, um, with an Ambu bag, um, on oxygen and it gives them about 40 to 50% oxygen. So not great, but better. All right. Um, in, uh, our environment, um, is 21% oxygen. So again, not great, but it's something. Okay. If we give them mouth to snout, um, that's 16% oxygen. Okay. So we're giving them breaths. It's some oxygen, but it's not wonderful. So again, number one choice is to intubate them. Okay. Has anyone ever given or seen a, someone place a, a needle right in their nasal filtrum? So right kind of under their nostrils. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. So what is that used yeah. for? Making breathe the acupressure point. Good, good. So it's actually called the Jen Chung or GV26 governor vessel, GV26 acupuncture point. Okay, so you can place, if you have acupuncture needles, you can use that. Otherwise, just use a really small needle. You place that there and you twirl it a couple times. Some people take it out afterwards. I usually just leave it in. Um, and so it is actually used, you're right, to help for respiration only. Okay. It only works in patients that have taken, um, I lie. It works in any of our patients. Um, so you can use that in um, our patients that are uh, just born. So like our little tiny, you know, puppies or kittens, you can use that in our patients that haven't, uh, that are, you know, sedated, um, that aren't taking a breath, those types of things. Okay. Um, it also has been known to help for patients that have seizures. Um, people don't know that either. Um, so you can use that to help prevent or hinder seizures. Um, however, if you have a patient that's seizing, I don't know that I would actually put a needle there, but you can press on it if you're there. So people have tried that as well. If we're ventilating a patient, make sure that you're not ventilating more than that 25 centimeters of water, unless your doctor says so, okay? So sometimes we will ventilate a little bit higher than that if we have a patient who has a known, like, um, a really bad pneumonia. We might go to, like, 25 centimeters of water or something like that, but typically we want to go at 30 centimeters of water. Anyone know for a large animal what ventilation is no greater than what? Actually, I don't know how to do CPR on a large animal. <laughs> Not necessarily <laughs> CPR per se, remember, because this is going back to even anesthesia. Because when we're doing any type of ventilation, right, we're not going higher than 20 centimeters of water. But what is it for a large animal? Guesses are fine. Would it be higher or lower? It's higher. Higher? Yeah. Is it 30? Mm -hmm. Yes, 30. Very good. So, yep, large animal is 30 centimeters of water. Very good. All right. Now, anyone know why we only do eight to 10 respirations per minute? Why, why are we hypoventilating versus hyperventilating? To avoid respiratory acidosis. Okay. So that's a thought too of like, we don't want to also increase or we want to increase the amount of carbon dioxide so they will breathe on their own eventually. That's one thought. But there's also another reason that I didn't realize until much later either just because of, I don't know, lack of 
too much information, I think, from being a vet tech student, but um, it's about perfusion to the brain. Can you get too much oxygen? Okay, so the reason being is that um, when we hyperventilate, okay, so we used to hyperventilate patients um, because the thought was to give a lot of breaths to get a lot of oxygen to them and right away. But what happened was, is that we, when we hyperventilate patients, it actually um, constricts the blood vessels going to the brain. And so that blood will not actually get to the brain very well. Okay. okay. So we were seeing a lot of death or additional death because we were hyperventilating patients. So if you actually go back to the 90s and watch episodes of ER, okay, I know <laughs> most of you will probably that's before your time, you'll actually hear them oh, say, okay. yeah, um, <laughs> I love watching it. Um, if you watch those episodes, they actually say hyperventilate the patient, okay? But that was like the old protocol to CPR. Actually, ER is pretty realistic to um actual medicine because I actually know I have a doc couple doctor friends. Um, but it is pretty, pretty realistic to what how medicine was practiced. Okay. Not like Grey's Anatomy style. Okay. Um, that's just drama. So <laughs> <laughs> but now we hypoventilate, all right, because what it is doing is that it's increasing the blood perfusion to the brain by not constricting those blood vessels so that that blood can get up there and oxygenate the brain. Okay. So that's the big reason. All right. So other things that we can do too are abdominal compression. So if you ever see or start doing on CPR, um, abdominal compressions, um, that's amazing to do. So a lot of times we focus on just doing compressions to the chest, but what happens is we're moving that blood to the rest of the body, but that body, because, um, our, that, that animal's body isn't working appropriately, all that blood's going to pool to the peripheral area and not come back. So what we need to do is have another person go to the rest of the body and then push that blood back to the heart so we can push it all, all over again, okay? So many times what I've seen is people alternating and, and pumping like that, okay? Or what we can do is we can wrap that patient up like a little mermaid, okay? And make it kind of tight so that when that person is pumping the chest, that blood isn't really going to the peripheral area. It's just kind of staying there, okay? Because we're in like crisis mode at this point, all right? And so what we need to do is we need to keep everything up in the, the front area, the cranial area, and that's the part that is necessary right now. The rest of the body can kind of wait, okay? Because we need to preserve the brain. We need to get that heart working, and then the rest of the body will get working after we get this half of the, the patient back up again. Okay. So equipment that we need, right? We obviously people are grabbing the ECG. That's really important. Okay. What is our next thing we need to grab? The next most helpful thing. Capnograph. The capnograph. No. Very good. Oh. Yes. 100%. We need that capnograph. Okay. So the capnograph is going to tell us how great our compressions are going, okay, and the likelihood of that patient actually surviving, all right? So it essentially is ref telling us um, it, how the amount of blood that's returning from the body to the lungs, and we essentially want that number to be greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. So it's not necessarily in this case telling us oh, this patient is essentially breathing um, or whatnot, that carbon dioxide that's coming out. It's essentially saying that from the return of the body and the lungs, we're getting that carbon dioxide to come out, which is greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. And that's great. That's a good prognosis that that patient is going to survive. If it's coming back at like zero, 
or two or whatever, that means that that patient's not responding very well. And we see that a lot, especially when animals come in and they've maybe arrested 20, 30 minutes ago, we'll get ones that are reading at like zero. And then we kind of know like, all right, if this patient is not responding in the next couple minutes, we should probably just stop. If this patient is at like 24 or like 30 or whatever, we're, we're keeping going because we're having a good response here. Okay, so we definitely want to use our catnograph because that's helpful. Is there anything else that's helpful? That'd be a natural. I'm talking, I'm sorry, I'm talking equipment. Stethoscope. Steth yeah, your stethoscope for sure, right? Because you're going to listen and see if you actually, because our ECG is saying electricity wise, right? So then you want to mm -hmm. listen with your stethoscope too to see if you're actually hearing anything. Very good. Anything else? Blood pressure. Defibrillator. Defibrillator. Good. Someone said blood pressure. We can maybe see with our blood pressure if we have anything kind of going on, or you can actually like, if you have a Doppler, put the Doppler on to see if you're hearing anything on your own, which you might not for a long time because the blood pressure we know is going to be really bad <laughs> for a while, right? So that's okay. Um, e SpO2 be helpful at all? Good question. So some people naturally grab an SpO2, right? Um, is our SpO2 going to be helpful in this case? I don't think so. Yeah, it's really not. SpO2 is, for me, almost never helpful for any type of patient. Um, they're not even reliable, right? Like, SpO2s okay. read on tables. <laughs> so so they're, they're not super reliable. And um, sometimes if we have too much stuff going on, it, it just kind of clogs everything up. So we actually don't really need the SBO2 at this point. Maybe, just maybe we would use it later if we got that patient back, but it's just not super reliable in the moment. So we don't have to use it. In that case, I think that some people put it on just because they're just used to doing it, but sometimes it just gets in the way and it's an extra beeping thing that is not needed. So the big things to keep that you definitely need ECG, capnograph, um, your stethoscope, and then having the defibrillator there. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So drugs. Perfect. So what are our drugs that we for sure need? Peppy, lidocaine, atropine. Good. So anyone ever hear of naval drugs? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's like your little acronym to keep in mind, right? So we have naloxone, atropine, um, uh, gosh, <laughs> vasopressin, epinephrine, and lidocaine, right? So what are so, what is so, um, important about these drugs? Like what makes them so special to be in this like little category? They can be administered so. through the endotracheal tube. Very good. They can go through the endotracheal tube. Very, very good. So um, no other drug can actually go through those endo the endotracheal tubes. So in order to do that, we just double the dose and then we can flush them through the endotracheal tube. All right. So if instead of taking the time to place an IV catheter right away, um, sometimes this can be hard to place an IV catheter. You can at least give a first dose down the endotracheal tube if you really need to and do it that way. Sometimes we can place an IV catheter right away. It's not a problem, but sometimes it can be a little bit hard. Also, if you're having a hard time placing a peripheral IV catheter, um, don't waste time to do a cut down and all of that. Place it in the jugular. Like, no, mm -hmm. there's no rules here, right? Like, you have a huge vessel in their neck. Place it in their jugular, okay? So atropine, what is atropine? Atropine brings your heart rate up. Okay, it brings heart rate up, brings your blood pressure up. What type of drug is it? Anticholinergic. Anticholinergic, very good. So it is going to help with bringing your heart rate up and bringing your blood pressure up. So is this an important drug to give right away? If your patient has no heart rate? 
wouldn't you give epi over atropine first? Very good. Very good. So epinephrine is like the spark plugs to your patient's body, right? So epinephrine is your true emergency drug that you need to give. Okay. So what is epinephrine actually called as a, um, as its actual brand name? There's a ton of brand names, but there's one particular brand name that it's called. We actually call it this as a hormone level that we that use. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Adrenaline. <laughs> what did you say? Um, I said adrenaline. Yes, it's adrenaline. Very good. So epinephrine is adrenaline. Okay. So when you guys have adrenaline, what happens? Everything goes up. <laughs> Everything goes up, right? <laughs> well, Your heart rate goes up. You're just like, blood pressure goes up. Everything is just, you could basically do anything, right? And so in this case, we're giving adrenaline to this animal and it's a kickstart, right? Like I said, it's the, we are, are, are basically jumping this animal's battery, like their car battery, okay? So if we do that to this patient, it's not going to last forever, okay? So adrenaline only lasts for a little bit and then you calm down, right? So that's where at um, atropine comes in, okay? So we give that adrenaline, say it works, and then we give atropine to maintain it, right? Um, so what about naloxone? What's naloxone? It's a reversal of what? For some drugs. Which ones? Opioids. Good, opioids. So what opioids might we need to reverse? Is that basically Narcan? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was like, why does it sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So what would we, what opioids might we reverse? Fentanyl. Fentanyl. Good. What else? Morphine. Morphine. Yep. Hydromorphone. Right. Good. Um. So that's always good to know right away is did that animal get into any medications? Right. Especially if they're coming in through ER, could they have gotten into anything? Who knows? Okay. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it doesn't hurt to ask any of those things. Right. Um, did they get into any medications that you had? Um, you know, people have diazepam at home too. So yes, we're talking about the common drugs here that we use, but like um, one of the ER episodes I saw was that uh, <laughs> there was a girl who took all these pills of, I think it was diazepam. So they had, they gave flumazenol and I was like, look, they even got the reversal right. My husband gets really annoyed because we watch it and I'm like checking their accuracy on everything. So <laughs> um, if the owner is unsure of getting into any medications, does it hurt? No. Nope. Give that. Just no, in case? especially naloxone. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like if you guys watch any of like the TikToks or... I know everyone does or like YouTube videos or whatever. And you even see like police officers giving naloxone just in case, like it doesn't hurt. That's why it's always nice. They even sell now Narcan like over the counter just for people to have, which I honestly don't think is a bad thing. You know, like it's such a scary environment that we live in because there are people that just don't even know that that may have been exposed to it. So yeah. It's really, side note really is scary. that you can go to any pharmacy and pick up a free kit too. Oh, I know. Cool. I, went, I went to a recent memorial um, for someone and they had free Narcan training. So I have that in my car always because I That's grew up awesome. with alcoholics. So, and you can always get your, um, if it expires, you can go to any pharmacy and just have it built through insurance or something and it's free. Yeah, that's a really, that's honestly a really great idea. So, I mean, side note, um, so I work in pet aftercare, okay? 
And um, I recent, this happened this week. So um, this is super scary, honestly, because it got me thinking about these types of situations. But um, we had someone bring a couple animals in to be cremated. And um, he had these pets in a container and um our our client care person um went to move the pets and, and put them in you know our dignity bags and stuff like that and when she went to move the one the first one all of this fluid splashed all over her and got in her eyes and her mouth and her skin and it started burning her all over and so they, you know, obviously had to call 911 and she went to the, you know, eye wash station and all of that. And then I came over to like help contain everything and the the smell, the gas smell and everything is just horrible. And I was trying to figure it out. And I'm like, it smells like formaldehyde, but like also this other weird smell that seems very familiar. So when I looked into it, I was like, it, it was actually um, embalming fluid. Ooh. And yeah, so um we had the guy come and pick up the animals, but it did get me thinking of people do a lot of different things. Right. And so we need to be prepared for really anything. Um, I don't think that he did this out of malice. I just think he didn't know, but if we went to cremate those animals, um, is highly, it's highly, highly flammable and it could have exploded the entire like place. And so, um, but what if somebody brought in an animal that had fentanyl in it or anything to that nature and like just didn't disclose that, like we need to all be just really prepared. So I'm glad that you mentioned that, that we can get those kits and stuff too, to just have it on hand to keep everybody safe. So it's scary. I want to say here now, cause my dad is retired now, but he used to be a paramedic, um, for 30 years here. And I want to say they're required to leave it if needed. Mm -hmm. To, I'm sorry, scene. like an extra dose at scene for future, like they're oh. allowed to leave Narcan. Got it. Got it. Like, obviously they transport the patient. They don't leave the patient, but like, if it's a house, like if they've overdosed, they can leave it at the house. Like they yeah. can give them a dose and leave with the patient. Yeah. They obviously don't just leave the patient there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's crazy, you know, like crazy world we live in it's so scary so um okay so lidocaine all right what do we use lidocaine for rhythmic okay good anti-arrhythmic in these cases right so oh. um think about okay it's an anti-arrhythmic typically we use it as a um an anesthetic right a local anesthetic but thinking about the fact that our heart is a muscle, okay? So I always looked at it as this. It's a, it's a muscle. And so when your heart is really, really angry at you, sometimes they're going to see that you're going to have like VPCs or that type of thing. Typically, in these cases, you see a lot of VPCs. And so if we give some lidocaine before we're going to go hard cardiac drugs, um, we'll give some lidocaine, just maybe calm down that heart a little bit and say, I'm sorry that you're ouchy. Let me give you something to make you feel a little bit better. Okay. If we do that and it works, we may even do a CRI just for a little bit to calm down that heart. So that's my interpretation of it, right? It's sure it's an antiarrhythmic, but we know that it's a local anesthetic. We can give that local anesthetic to that heart muscle that has been very angry. Okay. How about vasopressin? Is it like a vasodilator or something? So think of it as this, vasopressin. It's pressing on your vascular space. So it's vasoconstrictor. Helping with blood pressure. Yeah, it's going to help with our blood pressure, right? So um, it's really beneficial with hypertension. Okay. So, um, or hy yeah, hypotension. So we want to increase our blood pressure, right? So I always think of that as it's pressing on our, our vascular space so we can have vasoconstriction, right? Vasodilate means that we're decreasing our blood pressure. Vasoconstriction means we're going to help with our blood pressure and increase it. 
All right, so the other drugs beyond that, we have sodium bicarb, which we have talked about before. What do we use sodium bicarb for? Doesn't that help open up the sodium potassium channels? Or does that aid somehow? No, not typically. Sodium bicarb kind of, um, sodium bicarb is helping with our acid base regulation. So what are we doing with that? Regulating the gas exchange. Okay, by how? Um, between the CO2 and the uh, O2 in the lungs. No, no. I don't remember. <laughs> what have, okay, so if we have um, patients that have really bad acidosis, so anything less than 7.0, we can give some sodium bicarb to help get them back to the normal range of 7.35 to 7.45. Typically, if they're just like a little bit acidotic, like, you know, 7.2 or whatever, we can fix that with some fluid therapy and stuff to that nature. And their body will also fix that as we're helping them. But if it's really, really low, then we might have to give some sodium bicarb, okay? How about calcium gluconate? What do we do with calcium gluconate? That drives calcium back into the cells. Good. So sometimes we're low, the patients are low on calcium for different reasons, right? So one big one would be if they're eclamptic. So, you know, we have moms like dogs and cats who lost calcium due to their puppies or kittens. And so we might have to give them calcium. Sometimes it's due to the fact that they have a parathyroid issue. So they may need some calcium. Um, sometimes it could be that they um, might be an Addisonian crisis type of thing and need some calcium and they're just completely out of whack all together. Sometimes it could be that they are um, in labor and we need to give them oxytocin. And it's not just oxytocin that we should be giving because calcium gluconate augments that um, oxytocin to work better if we give calcium gluconate as well. So some people don't actually know that. Okay. So there's a lot of different things when it comes to it. All right. When animals are low on calcium, what do we typically see? Has anyone ever seen an eclamptic animal? Seizures. Good. So people think that it's seizures, right? And it can be looking like seizures because there are these big tremors that we see. And then they, with all of that movement, so just like seizures, we our patients end up having a fever, right? So um, they have a fever because their muscles get very rigid and then they start tremoring really bad. And so with all of that, their temperature goes up. Okay. And then when the temperature goes up really high, um, then we start potentially having brain damage. So we don't want to actually get their temperature to be really high. So we need to fix the calcium itself. And then sometimes we have to give maybe diazepam or anything like that to get some muscle relaxation because we want their muscles to relax. Okay. So is it truly a seizure? Eh, maybe not. It's, it's the muscles tremoring because it's, there's a lack of calcium there. Okay. And then they wouldn't want to move much either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel so bad, but it is such an easy fix. So that's the cool thing. Like that's, those are the emergencies that I love because it's like, we can fix these things. Right. Um, and then flumazenol. Okay. We kind of talked about that already. Right? Flumazenol is. Reversal. It's a reversal of what was it? Sorry, flumazenol. Flumazenol. Oh, flumazenol is a reversal of benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines. Good. So diazepam, midazolam, lorazepam, alazepam, all of the pams, right? Very good. How about adapamazole? That's for dextone. 
Okay, dextomotor, good. So some people know it as antecedent, right? But it's really good so that you guys know the generic names, okay? So adapamazole is an alpha-2 agonist antagonist, all right? So remember, agonist is what makes them fall asleep, okay? So like dexmedetomidine, um, xylazine. The antagonist, or like the little five-year-old kids, right, on the Saturday wakes <laughs> up the agonist, right? A antagonist is they're antagonizing the agonist okay okay so um remember we can give for routes of administration iv it's great um your jugular iv is great if you have to give it io that's fine because sometimes we have like little, little patients that we have to give io catheters stuff like that et tube you double that iv dose intracardiac okay not our first choice but we can give it we give a tenth of the dose usually when i've seen doctors give it they're like just give it to me i'll give it i see and then they just give the whole dose and it's like their hail mary and i'm like oh, you didn't have to give all of that but whatever um and then for your flushes right remember no heparin okay we don't do heparin anymore it's super old um for our flushes, we flush three to five mils for cats, five to 10 mils for uh, small dogs, and then 10 to 15 mils for large dogs because our patients for CPR are typically not on fluids during that time. So we have to make sure that that medication gets all the way to the heart, okay? Open chest CPR, we typically don't necessarily jump to open chest CPR for every pet. However, there are certain cases where we have to do open chest CPR um, versus closed chest. So if it's a pneumothorax, a diaphragmatic hernia, a flail chest. So flail chest means that if their um, ribs are broken on the top of their, their chest here and then also the bottom. So if they were breathing, it would actually move like this and, and there's no connection there. So the problem is that if we actually did closed chest CPR, um, we risk lacerating you know, their lungs or even their heart or anything like that. So we actually have to do open chest, if that makes sense. Okay. Now, this is kind of a dirty prep method and not the most sterile procedure, but we try our best to keep it clean and sterile. Okay. So you shave um, a strip behind the le left fifth intercostal space. You wipe it down really quick with a little Clorhex if you can and some alcohol, and then you surgically, you know, have your doctor surgically open. Um, you typically have a surgical pack ready and waiting always in your crash cart for any type of open chest. And then typically your doctor is um, gloving up and then will probably have another technician or something glove up with you um, so that you can work on it. Um, and then you guys are always looking at your ECGs, which we've kind of gone over before, but you're looking for like a systole, of course, um, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and then any type of pulseless electrical activity of what you can actually defibrillate. Okay. Now, when you're defibrillating, it's not like on TV, right? Where they defibrillate and then all of a sudden the person like wakes up and then they're all good to go. When you defibrillate, it's that they're trying to restart the heart rhythm. So after they defibrillate, you have to actually still do CPR because they're essentially stopping what's going on and so that you can restart like a good rhythm on your own. So um, there is no like defibrillate and then that person restarts a rhythm completely on their own. No, it's you restarting that rhythm. All right. So that's what gets me really frustrated when I watch Grey's Anatomy. Um, there's also, um, when you guys use the defibrillator, um, make sure that you shave the area as much as you possibly can of where you're going to defibrillate. And then you use the little jelly, right? Your ultrasonic jelly or you have the defibrillator jelly. And then you're defibrillating the animal. You can completely light your animal on fire if you are using any kind of alcohol, all right? So definitely don't do that. We have 
charred animals before by just having alcohol on our leads. So if you know that you might defibrillate an animal, try to only use the jelly even for your ECG leads. Make sure that you have an animal on a pad or a blanket or anything and not on um, a type of metal surface um, when, when you're defibrillating as well and always back away. So stay clear because nobody wants to have that electrical activity go through them. That's not fun. Um, and then make sure you guys also know your fluid doses is too, your shock dosage, which I know that we've gone over several times. So the shock doses are made from the blood um, total volume in a patient. Okay, so dogs is about 90 mils per keg, cats are 50 to 50, uh, 5 mils per keg, and then your head of starch and vet of starch dosage for the day. So head of starch is 20 mils per keg and vet of starch is 50 mils per keg per day. Um, let's see. Um, make sure too that you're looking for what we say is a fusion, um, edema, um, stuff like that. So you may look at that and then also the electrolytes and fix any type of electrolyte balance, right? So if you have potassium, that's really high. How do we get rid of potassium? Um, how are we going to get rid of our glucose issue? Like what if that glucose is really high, right? How can we get rid of that? Um, so know those types of things. Okay, so what if a potassium is really high? How can we get rid of potassium? What if you have an animal that comes in, their potassium is really, really high and they've arrested? What are you gonna do? Um, fluids. Okay. Fluid? Okay. It's not going to get rid of the potassium per se. How do we get rid of potassium? Diuretics. And give her calcium. I don't know. Will it drive it into? So that calcium is one part. Okay. What? Mm. Dialysis. What what animal gets a high a high potassium a lot of times? Cow. Okay. How about in small animal? Cats. Cats. Okay. So you have a cat that comes in, it is arrested, and then you look at the electrolytes and it's potassium super high. Why did it arrest? Did it block no okay good it was blocked yeah, yeah. okay so how are you going to get rid of that potassium unblock unblock <laughs> it good that's one part right so that's one part so your doctor is unblocking the cat okay now how else can we get rid of this potassium what have you seen diet change okay but the cat's yeah. dead so oh, yeah. okay okay so in the immediate, what are we doing? Okay, we're unblocking the cat. What else? Does it have to do with the kidneys? Mm, no. Electrolytes, think. What are we doing? Anyone ever see insulin given? No, if not. Interesting. In a little bit of insulin and a little bit of dextrose. I believe I saw it once, but okay. it was like really quick and I didn't really understand. Okay. <laughs> so essentially what's happening is that that insulin is going to pull out that potassium. Okay. The dextrose also is going to pull out a little bit of that potassium as well. Um, and the dextrose is also going to make sure that we're not like actually you know, making the cat who's not diabetic, right, um, have enough, enough dextrose to make up for the insulin pull, right? So, but 
the idea behind it is remember that we're dealing with electrolytes. So if we have too much of an electrolyte, we need to pull it out. All right. So in this case, the insulin, mostly the insulin is pulling out that that potassium It's pulling it away so that we can excrete it out properly. But currently that cat can't excrete anything. So that's why the doctor is making it so that the cat can excrete it. So in this time, yes, we need to try to get the cat back. But we can't either because the cat is dying because this potassium is killing the heart. So that's like twofold here. So that's why doing blood work is really, really important to find out why this cat is dying. All right. It's one thing to be like, okay, we need to get this cat back. But why did the cat die anyway, essentially? Like we need to figure that out ASAP. Okay. Um. And go from there. So pulling blood is really, really helpful. And and if you can run a blood panel while you're doing CPR and have someone do it so that you can find out the whys, it can be really life-saving too. And understanding yourself the whys so that, yeah, you're not diagnosing, but then you can go, oh my gosh, I see a problem. Let me at least set up for something. I think this cat might be blocked due to the fact that the potassium is really high because you understand, right? Then, then when the doctor comes back, they can confirm it too, right? So it makes you super valuable. All right. So blood gases and electrolytes are super, super helpful. Even if that cat wasn't blocked, things change so crazy when the cat or the dog are not alive, like your pH is going to change, so you got to fix it somehow. Um, now, monitoring. So say the animal gets back, you're going to have to monitor that animal really closely. They can become hyperglycemic really easily. So you may have to like give um, dextrose that way. And this is where your burial trials come into play really nicely too, because you might have to change it all the time to keep up with that animal. Um, anaphylaxis can happen too, based on certain things. Um, internal hemorrhage might happen too, just from chest compressions or things that prior to happen. So just kind of keeping an eye on them. Um, you may have some acidosis or have to supplement them for electrolytes and stuff too. Um, but monitoring them, especially for any type of brain hypoxia, um, just from them not getting a lot of oxygen, you know, prior to that, um, and then reperfusion as well. So if they need fluids and stuff, okay? So monitoring them, like their temperature, if they're not able to thermoregulate, that's a really bad thing afterwards. So that could be that they might re-arrest um, or whatever. So thermoregulating is important to monitor for. Why uh, would that be them re-arresting, sorry? For thermoregulating? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Is it the perfusion or is it? So your temperature regulating center is in your brain. So um, that's just a poor prognosis that like there might be some brain damage there. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. That's why too, when you have like cats who um, after surgery, maybe you've given like an opioid um, and their temperature goes sky high. Um, yeah. It's because your thermal regulator is in the brain. It's not because they're just crazy. I mean, they're just crazy. More <laughs> <than like that. laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like I said, it's just an interesting thing. Like once you like understand the physiology of how that works, like, um, you know, that they might have had brain damage and like that's where it all like the pieces start fitting together. So that makes sense. Thank yeah. You. Mm -hmm. Again, remember, survival to discharge for these guys are zero to three percent. Um, but just for the CPR in that initial setting when they first come in, though, is four to nine percent. So it's still not great, right? But if we can like know at least what we're doing to get them there, then that's awesome. You know, it can save at least some. Um, now. If it's anesthesia wise, we have a better chance. So that's awesome. What uh, would the, um, uh, sorry. No, you're good. Um, what would the like ECG look like? Would it be like the superventricular 
um, like if they're super like high cal uh, sorry high potassium. Okay, so if they had the high potassium, um, remember you're gonna end up seeing the tented T waves. So like for for cats that have the high potassium levels, um, our potassium ends up making those T waves really high. If you ever see that. Now, so any any kind of weird electrolyte stuff, you're gonna see it kind of within the T wave, but especially especially potassium, you'll see what we call tented T's, because the your T wave will end up being like almost just as tall as your QRS. Oh, and that's why sometimes your ECG will like almost double count because it's like looking at it as almost an R wave. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So, it always looks so crazy and like, oh my God, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> so that's where I'll like print, try to print it out and then do my own counting just to confirm that it's not like 300 or whatever. But, yeah. um, that kind of confirms a little bit more to me that like, oh, maybe we're dealing with a blocked cat. Usually it's blocked cat, right? Like we see those more often, but you could have a blocked dog. Um, I've placed, you know, urinary catheters in male dogs and female dogs um, before too, where they have high potassiums. I mean, typically you're going to see more blocked male dogs because their urethra is smaller than the female dogs, but we've had it with female dogs too that have like stones that are huge, so. Yeah, yeah. Or you have male dogs who have um, transitional cell carcinoma, which is so sad. And it's like right there where they can't pee. So you may try to place a urinary catheter to bypass it if you can, if you can, um, just to get by. So yeah, there's a lot of like little things. Oh, that's so sad. It's really sad. Yeah. But like I said, the most, the most of them that you see are, you know, black cats, right? Like it just, they come in waves. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> COVID. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So any other questions you guys have? How fast is the response time when you give those emergency drugs through the endotracheal tube? Through the endotracheal tube, yeah. Um, you probably use 60 seconds. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, is it going to be faster or slower? Or... <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not really that much slower, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then would you give the insulin and the calcium the same way, or do you give it a different way when you're in that? Good question. Good situation? question. Yeah. So some people will give um, insulin some Q, or you can give it IV too, both of them. Okay. Yeah. That's actually a really good question. It just kind of depends on the doctor and what they want to do. So, I didn't know where it was an emergency type situation. If you'd want the uptake to be a lot faster, yeah, um, I would say if, if it's you a, could wait the same time. Yeah, I would say if it's like your arrest patient, like they've arrested, I'd give it IV. But like I've seen it in um, patients that were just unblocking normally that some doctors are giving it sub Q. And then I've also seen it where they're giving them IV, you know, like, I think it's just doctor preference of how they want to do it. So. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. But it's super helpful, honestly, especially if their potassium is really high because it's nice to be able to give it before you're starting to anesthetize them because it's scary to anesthetize something that, you know, they they could potentially crash during that time because they're, they're not stable, you know, like cats aren't going to show you that they're not stable until the very end. Right. So we have to think of that. You wouldn't think something like potassium would be something that you'd really have to worry about where everybody's like eat your bananas get your potassium right, <laughs> right. No, don't mess with potassium right yeah <laughs> too much of it will definitely uh kill you so and i've there have been people um there have been doctors that um have used potassium chloride like a significant amount of it to 
euthanize pets before, which is not okay. It's not um, because it's definitely not a um, nice death. And I'll say this. I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, it was really hard to get um, pentobarbital, like euthanasia yes. solution. And so there was a lot of conversation over what to actually use. And, and there were people at that time, because they didn't know what to use, that they were using potassium fluoride as well. Um, but it's it's not the best because it, it can cause a lot of distress to patients. Um because you're essentially causing like a heart attack. Yeah. So, yeah. So I was, I was kind of monitoring that in discussion groups because it's, I'm not a person obviously that's like in all practices all the time watching this stuff. Like I'm very lucky that I get to go to practices and visit people and see people and talk to people on stuff. Like I, I have like 400 practices in my area that I visit, but I, I don't get to actually be with them in their all of their practices so um yeah it's interesting i'm glad we now have the appropriate medications at the moment i i have a silly question <laughs> yeah so if like okay so say a patient arrests right it's it's intubated and you're breathing for the patient yeah and like others are performing CPR, you would go over that 20 millimeters of water because you're contra you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like so you, when you're watching the manometer, you would go over, you would go to 20 centimeters of water. Um, I see what you're saying, like based on how they are doing those chest compressions, like maybe it would go slightly over because maybe they gave that chest compression at the same time of the breath, right? Is that what you're kind of yeah, indicating? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, typically, no, it's probably not going to do that. But even if you get went over just a little bit, it's, it's really not going to probably do that much because sometimes, like I said, if that's a patient that has like a pneumonia or whatever, we're going to go to like 25 or something to that nature. Um, but I can see what you're saying on that. Um, but no, it's, it's not horrible. That's why we just want to monitor it to make sure that yeah. you're going to that 20 and then going back down. Um, so I, I asked that cause I literally, I didn't want to go over 20 and I got yelled, not by the doctor, but one of the leads at the time, um, she's like, you need to move air. And like, I, I was like, wait, what? Like it really like threw me off, but it's, you know, it's a stat situation. So you're just kind of like, okay, I'm going to do it. You know, like I just, so what did they want you to go to? Literally full, like just like squeeze the bag as hard as you can oh my gosh no 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 i was so stressed no that's scary no it was it was really scary and like i don't know what or i don't know i was freaking out i was like oh my god that's that's really scary no we go to 20 centimeters of water unless like i said unless you have a patient where really like they have they have to be a, a little bit higher but even if it's like a pneumonia case you're not really worried about that until maybe you get them back and maybe on a ventilator and then you kind of worry about like really what they need to be maintained at like but if you're yeah. going to like 60 you then risk of even more damage you know of like popping a lung or yeah, creating exactly. a bulla or whatever you know so that's exactly where I was I mean unfortunately like the patient was already you know yeah but I was just really stressed out about the whole situation because I was like, this doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah. So that goes to, again, I think, you know, I, I'm not going to trash, you know, really like fear free or whatever. But I think that maybe we have focused so much of our efforts on certain credentials in the practice that we aren't focusing on some of the other things, like there's nothing wrong with focusing on everything too, you know? So like, sure, we focus so much on fear free, but like, let's backtrack on, yeah. you know, some of these patients that like 
we should all be focused on recover as well. You know, if, yeah. if we're going to do everyone be fear-free certified, then we better do recover as well and package it. Yeah, that makes be- sense. Maybe. Because the fact that like some of our doctors don't even know the basics, it's a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but we all know that we want to give all of our patients like whipped cream. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate it. I really do. I appreciate that we want to give them like the best you know, care and love at a practice visits. But then if they arrest, we all don't know what how to do. How does that help? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, so, how, truly, how does that help? Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that like we all need to start making plans of like, all right, we're all fear-free certified. Now what's the next step? And how yeah. we're going to become better overall. So Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Oh my God, that makes me feel so much better because I was really (laughs) like, oh my gosh, am I like, you know, not seeing it? And yeah, yeah. Nope. (laughs) Nope, you're not the crazy one. It's okay. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll admit, like, us old people, we get out of practice, right? Like, that's why I really honestly I love doing this with you guys because I tell everybody like you guys keep me fresh you know yeah. because <laughs> there are times like last week right like I was wrong about something and I was like shoot I gotta look that up really quick because I don't want to tell you guys the wrong thing but it keeps me fresh on yeah. what is going on and sometimes I think that some of us that have been in the field for a long time we just keep doing the same thing over and over again And we lose actually like maybe what's the new stuff that's out or that we just forget like the meaning behind certain things. So I think that that's an important part is that we, the ones that have been in the field for a long time need to keep up with the whys and what's new. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. She, so the lead is actually younger than me. (laughs) Okay. Okay. And, um, she, you know, she's very intelligent. She's like, she's the one that like does the surgeries and stuff. Like she's a surgical tech, but it was just, I was just so, you know, I questioned so much on myself that I was like, what do I, you know, what am I missing? And it was like really hard, you know? Yeah. But yeah, no, that, that is one of the reasons why I really love this field too, is that it's always changing, which yep. is awesome. Yeah. And there's so much that, you know, you guys can do, like, that's the cool thing. Um, you guys are here in a great time to be able to decide what you like and what you want to do. And it's not, you know, that you have to work in a veterinary hospital for the rest of your life. Like there's so many cool options that you'll be able to do. Like I've done way too many things in my career that but they've all been so much fun and like it just keeps you learning new things too um so I I think that's what the cool part is is that there's never there's always opportunity to like keep you learning and growing and meeting new people um and sharing passions on stuff so you know and and there's room for you know, people say all the time, like, there's no, no way that you can make a, a living in what we're doing. Yes, there is. You just got to find, find yeah, it. Exactly. So. I mean, if it, like, I used to be in office administration and like, I, you know, like that was my career path for like years. Right. And I was like, one day I was like, why am I so stressed for something? Like, I really don't care about. <laughs> and yeah. so like, it's probably been about five years in this field and I just, it, it's my soul. Like I absolutely love it. And you know, it, it's just, it, I learn something new every day, which I absolutely enjoy. So. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So this week we have coming up, um, oh, wait, let me just double check my weeks. So I don't tell you guys wrong. So this week we have, um, 
So I have communications training. I am going to put in today um, some grief support stuff for you guys and euthanasia stuff and aftercare stuff for you. Um, and then there's QPR training, psychological safety stuff, and office managers, office manager stuff it is a very like short um review on it. Um, and then there's those of you guys who are like, I don't know if you guys are getting close to taking your test or anything, there's stuff on um techniques for test preparation, stress relief, all of that. And then there's a final review. So if any of you guys, like I said, are taking your test this week coming up or next week, um, definitely take that. Um, those of you guys who might not be taking your test yet, you can come back to that later um, for the final review. And then you guys will have opportunity to do pharmacy and pharmacology and start working on that too. Um, I We will have our next class on the 17th, so next week. Um, however, on the 24th, um, we actually won't be having class. Um, I'm actually going to be out of town and driving out of town. So I won't be able to like actually be online. Um, so we'll have class next week and like talk about um, aftercare stuff and all of that. And then maybe touch on pharmacology. Um, and then we'll actually go over pharmacology and some anesthesia stuff on the 31st. Okay. So I just kind of wanted to let you guys know and keep you prepared for that. All right. Any questions? So if we do our test, mine is on the 18th. Okay. Uh, would you recommend just going to the practice? So uh, prepare. Yeah, so do like all of the the communication stuff and all of that if you want to and then um so the QPR communications and then final review because there's not that much for the communications and QPR training because honestly like that section in itself for the test is very very small and okay. then doing the final review and stuff too and then if you do have time and want to like go through some of the other sections as well, just to kind of review since your test is coming up, I would recommend just kind of going through some of what you feel like is, you know, just a review and, okay, you know, say you're like, actually, I just want to review anesthesia because I was nervous about that one. You could do that too. Okay. All right. And then they'll be good because next week. You'll review everything um, with us and then you'll be ready for your test. So, yikes. <laughs> Yay. Uh, you'll be fine. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Just remember, you don't have to know every question, right? Like, it's okay. I remember when I took my test, I was like, oh, I have no idea what that is, but that's okay because me the next one I'll probably know, you know? So, <laughs> I did a few practice. Yeah. Um, someone from my workplace printed up her previous VTE attempt. Okay. Practice and some are so much harder than others. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> I hope it won't be too hard. <laughs> I mean, just make sure when you read it, like you're trying to figure out what they're truly asking. Remember, they try to give yeah. you extra information to kind of throw you off. Or a lot of people will say like, they gave me a question on a tortoise or whatever. It's like, are they really asking you though something about a tortoise? You know, are, yeah. they, are they asking you something about a dolphin? Probably not, you know, like that's just crazy. So like, what are they truly asking you here? Maybe they're just throwing in some sort of weird species just to throw you off. So- that's where our anxiety comes in to play. So we just have to maybe yeah. like sit back for a second and be like, these jerks are trying to throw me off. What are they <laughs> really asking? Right. So. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it won't be a too hard one. <laughs> yeah. I feel like my tests are usually harder than the VCE. &E, so. so I think you'll be oh. all right. Fingers crossed. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, of course. 
All righty. So I'll see you all next week. Um, hope you guys have a great week and then reach out if you need anything. So thank you. Have a good week. Yeah, you too. Take care. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.